Thank you, everybody, for joining us at the Circle City Con Lockpick Village run by Tool. We've got a panel today with uh, the lockpicking lawyer, Bosnian Bill, and Lock Noob. That's going to be moderated by our own board member, Deviant Olaf. So uh, I'm very excited for this. Feel free to take it away, Deev. Yeah, right on. This is this is an historic time. I think a lot of people were amazed that they were going to get to see everyone like this together. So just off the hop, if you didn't see who was waving when, and some of you might be on mobile with small screens, so you can't see whose stickers are whose. Let's get a quick wave out of Lockpicking Lawyer. Excellent. Hey there, folks. Cheers. That's, that's the authenticator. You hear his voice. Absolutely. And much like Bosnian Bill as well from the Lock Lab. Hey, guys. And all the way from the UK, we have Lock Noob. Hi. Fantastic. This is fantastic. Now, some people may have uh, maybe been expecting the, the big reveal. Like, oh, my God, all these folk in the same place. We're going to see faces. But hands only is hands only is your jam, right? I'm, I'm here representing. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, only me. What, what were some of the decisions that I'm sure it puzzles people occasionally? Like, man, even on a thing like this, why only hands? Anybody want to talk about why you've chosen to, was it artistic or was it practical? Has it been beneficial that you chose to still be known only as hands in the internet? Well, I can start there. I don't know. I'm sure each of us has our own personal reasons, but mine started out from my, my practice of law that I represent a lot of well-known companies. Um, and I didn't want the fact that I was involved in something arguably counterculture to get involved in, in my legal practice or interfere with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once I started getting bigger, um, I didn't want internet weirdos showing up at my house thinking it'd be really cool to try to pick the front door of the lock picking lawyer. <laughs> Um, Absolutely. You know, the, the internet's a strange place. Um, my inbox can attest to that. So uh, that's largely my reasons. That and my, my wife doesn't particularly want it well known. <laughs> but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> now, Bill, I know you've been also very uh, guarded with who you are. So to the point that there's like speculation that people know who Bill is. I once... I, I was deployed to a secret mission on Mars. Like there's there's stories in the lock world. Somebody says they they sure they ran into you long ago, uh, but I'm pretty sure that's not true because you're holed up pretty well in the in the anon anonymity world as well. Yes. Well, it's uh, it's more personal. I'm I'm not nearly as attractive as Harry, so I'm quite you know like ugly as sin. In fact, so uh, no, seriously, I I could confirm that. Yeah, it's true. Uh, a lot of it also is the uh, same reasons as Harry. I mean, my job, uh, one of the agreements is to, in having a uh, YouTube channel was I couldn't let out anything personal. Now, over time, I've been doing this a long time. Some of it has kind of leaked out here and there. Or in the early days, I made a mistake of letting out my, my you know, when somebody says, I want to send you something. So I gave them my private address. And like Harry mm -hmm. says, it turned out that there are some, uh, some not, you know, <laughs> unusual <laughs> things happening out there and we'll talk a little bit about that later i think but i got to work my way into it <laughs> excellent now in the uk there, there is a thriving lock sport commercial you know world in the uk we have a tool chapter over there we have a number of lock pickers over there um lock noob would we have run into you at tool uk events or do, how many people know who you are on your side of the phone um so just through my youtube channel but uh about six months in I started to look at the UK Lot Sport Forum, met some people on there. Uh, then I, I've been going to various meetups, lot picking villages around. I, I don't tend to massively advertise who I am when I go places. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, it's just nice to be part of the general community. And the reason that I hands only is, uh, well, first, because everybody else is sort of hands only. Um, and I, you know, let's be honest, I think when you first start doing your YouTube channel, you tend to emulate people like Bill, who are hands only. So it just seemed like the natural thing. And then the other thing is, I just don't really like pictures of myself anyway. Um, so I just, yeah, the thought of having to look back at myself over hundreds of videos just sounds awful. I hear you. I hear you. Well, I think it's a great aesthetic. I think it, people might, uh, if, they're, if people aren't like from the internet and understand YouTube, they might be like, oh, that's so 
you know, very distancing and you can never, people don't connect to that. I think people connect to all of you a great deal. I think uh, that just with your presentation style, your voices are very iconic and it's, uh, it brings a great deal of peace to everyone. At least on, whenever I watch your videos, all of you, that the consistency of presentation kind of warms me up inside. Speaking if of- I can add to it, inside. I should say that, that seeing my face really wouldn't add to the, to the content. It would just, if anything, distract from it. Exactly. And there's no reason. It's, it's a very simple format. Here's a lock. Here are, here's what I like about it. Here's what I don't like about it. Um, you know, they're my personal opinions, but my face really has nothing to do with you know, how I treat a lock on, on my desk here. I tend to agree with Harry. It's about the lock. It's about the picking. It's about the techniques. You know, it's about education. It's not about me or my face. And I can personally attest that it's possible to get very lost in Harry's eyes. So yes, this is probably <laughs> better to be free. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are we all uh, warming Cheers. ourselves up inside with today? Ah, excellent uh, question. Uh, here's my Bill, backup. why don't you start us out? <laughs> Nothing but the good stuff, guys. <laughs> I had pizza King, for lunch, so this was a natural fit. <laughs> excellent. King Pilsner. I'm on um, uh, a, a gin and tonic. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I'm going through a, a gin phase at the moment. Excellent. I've been on a scotch phase for uh, 10 years, which is most of my drinking life. <laughs> well, not that much. <laughs> but here we've got some uh, some Lagavulin in 16, which uh, is one of my favorites. And chances are, if you've seen one of my videos, uh, you've seen me after having downed a glass of it. So cheers. Or two. <laughs> I, am, I am robbing the, the cradle, great. as it turns out. Woo-hoo! Yeah with a 12 but other than that harry and i are very aligned is that the nick offerman uh signature i've been told that his is either the 12 or an 11 year release that i've never seen outside of the jack rose wow. and I've i think we were there some of the last times they were open so all right but that's people are, are not here for the drinking as much as the picking except for us maybe you say that well, i am <laughs> yes oh and which gym do you have that I'm really partial to this number three gin because it's actually got a, uh, I think it's actually some like pot metal key. It's only a half of one, but I reckon that could actually, that, that might be a future video. That's oh, actually very work. Cool. Yeah, it might actually work on one of those uh, sort of lever latch shed locks we get in the UK. <laughs> so I was actually going to try that. It's, a, it's another excuse to get another bottle of gin anyway. Right? <laughs> That's fantastic. I want to do an homage to that and slap a key into this bottle over here somehow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Someone asked, by the way, what is on lockpicking lawyers table? Is that a xenomorph? One of the one of the public uh, questions that came in. Uh, oh, it is indeed. This is uh, I remember well, Doom came out when I was, I don't know, maybe a freshman in high school. One of my favorite games. I remember. Uh, gosh, I'm not sure if this is legal, but pooling money with my uh, with my friends to buy Doom 2 when it eventually came out. Spent a lot of good hours playing that when I grew up. Although the more relevant one to my channel is probably this sticker, which of course says safety third. <laughs> Absolutely. One dark one makes those. <laughs> so what got everyone started with lock picking? How long ago, you know, was this something all your life? Did you pick it up relatively? Would it surprise people late in life, early in life? Well, I can start there. Um, I first made an attempt to pick when I was probably in, in middle school. I was really young. I thought it'd be cool to start picking locks. And I, of course, was terrible at it. There really weren't many resources back then. YouTube didn't exist. I think the only thing around was the MIT Guide to Lock Picking. So I stopped picking. And it wasn't until many years later that I actually saw one of Bill's videos online that was soon after I had moved to DC, kind of all of my, my hobbies went by the wayside side in my move and uh, it looked pretty cool. So I bought some lock picks, tried again, and, uh, and pretty soon you saw the lock picking lawyer online. Fantastic. Um, I, I started because, uh, do you know what? I, I had a few too many gins and I was on Amazon uh, just 
And, and yeah, I, I'm just looking at what to buy, and I saw this a much like, better story. <laughs> yeah, this plastic, plastic practice padlock, and it had like these little lock picks, and I was like, that looks so cool. I I, I don't know anything about it. I'm going to get a lock. So um, of course, when I got it and I, I could open it, like uh, you know, by, by raking with a city rake, I just thought I was like the bomb. I thought I was like the best lock picker in the world. So I went around everybody going, look, I can pick locks with this little uh, acrylic lock, and. Uh, <laughs> And then I found the internet, and it. Uh, and then I realised I was clearly terrible, and uh, everything was a con. Um, but of course, you know, I also stumbled onto um, uh, Bill's channel, and uh, that really kind of like set the groundwork for me, just getting sort of into locks and things. But the reason I picked up the hobby in the first place, apart from uh, a weak moment of too much gin, was that uh, I'd actually had a lot of hobbies. Um, but then we had a, um, a, a kid and then, uh, wow, your time just goes down the drain and, and then all those hobbies go. And I just felt like a couple of years in, uh, that it was, um, yeah, I didn't have anything for myself. So this was a really nice hobby. It was quiet. Um, and you know, you could just, everybody's in bed. You can just, you know, quietly pick some locks in front of the television and yeah, it, it sort of grew from there. Really. It was, um, it's, it is really just a fantastic sometimes frustrating but brilliant hobby and um, i'm really glad that i got into it but that was only four years ago wow wild well i, I started out under duress the army <laughs> forced me to learn how to do it a lot of you guys know that i was uh, an explosive ordnance disposal and of course we a lot of you don't know uh, in the army we also work with the secret service and they'd have to search a lot of different things, buildings and cabinets and closets and you know suitcases, et cetera. And a lot of times the doors are locked. So the Army thought it would be a good idea to spend one day teaching us how to pick locks. Mm -hmm. And that's all they did. They gave us a really cheap, but at that time it was a magical HPC kit, which in hindsight was probably about a $3 set of picks. Mm -hmm. And they gave us literally just a few hours of how to how to rake open locks and then left it at that and the rest of it was left up to us to try to improve and so it took a lot of time um i just some guys get interested in it and some guys don't i just started pick, buying uh pad locks and trying to open different locks and uh, over time i just got a little bit better and better at it like as are most most things that you practice <laughs> yeah and it's got to be a real practical uh satisfaction of when you apply that skill especially it's almost double double duty i would imagine in a field like that you have the, the primary objective you're you're accomplishing you know help people do a sweep help people make sure a building is safe for a, a critical asset but at the same time you're doing it in a way that you're being like a good neighbor to others the building owner the, the tenants they're not having doors destroyed or disrupted because you're doing it in a very non-invasive way yeah that's right um, i think before a lot of doors that they couldn't open they'd end up pry, you know prying open Mm -hmm. So a lot of the damage was being done. I think that's really what motivated the Secret Service to get us to try to pick these things for them. It worked out well for everybody. It turned into a great hobby. Yeah. So you said you learned from, well, kind of from government instruction. Are there other people, uh, lock pickers or other sources that you really <laughs> recall learning a lot from? And that the rest of the uh, panel, who are some other oh, people yeah. that you all learned from a great deal? Absolutely. Um, going way back. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember uh, a guy called Kokomo Lock. Uh, he's actually still a locksmith. Um, I've seen him, his advertisements on Facebook, et cetera. Um, but he was great, just fantastic. I don't know why he dropped out, I guess it was four or five years ago. I uh, learned a lot from him. Another one that I, I watched literally every one of his videos, Wizwazzle, just a great guy. He, he opened up what I consider to be impossible locks at the time. Uh, which were American padlocks. And so I really learned how to open those and how to beat uh, serrated pins from Wizwazzle. So I really miss having him around as well. Mm -hmm. And then he, lately, he, I've yeah, been learning as well. Skylar Town, he, another one, uh, it's not around anymore. I made some great educational videos. And then uh, lately, I probably learned more watching Harry than anybody else because he's turned into just one incredible <laughs> lock picker. He's probably, I know Larry, Harry, you're turning red, but uh, you're probably one of the best lock pickers I've ever run into. Well, thank you. And, uh, and right back at you. When I first started, I used to just turn on your videos and watch them for hours and hours while I practiced. 
Um, You're the one. Even if I wasn't paying <laughs> active attention to them, they were always running in the background as I was picking. And uh, I'll tell you, one of your videos had a lot of influence on my video format. And that was the one on lock picking fakery on oh, yeah. YouTube. And it's the reason why I don't do voiceovers. I don't do video cuts unless I'm changing to a different room. Everything's always done in stream of consciousness, one take. Um, and that's because it would be so easy to fake what I do on YouTube. Um, using the format that, that you had suggested in that video, which is essentially just one take, go right through it. Um, it adds a lot of authenticity to it. I agree. And, you know, things have changed over the last, I guess, three years uh, in that direction. There used to be so many fake videos, guys making videos, just they would just pick up a lock that we everybody knew was impossible, zip, 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 and it was open. And it, and it would leave you wondering, my gosh, how did he do that? And we don't see that anymore. And I think that's good for the entire lock sport community. A mm -hmm. little bit of honesty. I, and that's that's so true. Um, I, I remember that same video. It must be one of your uh, most enduring ones, Bill. Uh, and it's, I think it's the reason why, even myself included, you know, once you pick a lock, you know, if you can, you gut it straight away and you do it on camera. Although I have to admit, I started to fast forward guttings um, uh, by a few times just because they can be lengthy. Uh, exactly. but yeah, I, mean, yeah. I think I think you changed how people uh, approach uh, uh, picking locks and making sure that they show that when they did pick it, they really did pick it. Yeah, I think that's better for everybody. Too many too many guys were sending me. Uh, messages saying how frustrated they were that they couldn't equal you know so-and-so's video they couldn't open that lock and despite hours and hours of trying and i can understand the frustration i felt it myself and that was a big motivator for me to start making videos rather than you know sitting back in the shadows and watching yeah now i've seen inspired by your commentary and the community in general there's there's come to be this almost standard language of how to do a video if you're trying to prove an open i think the Reddit community and others there is, you know, here's a series of bullet points. You have to do this and not do this. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. I think the big one is don't let the lock leave the scene, you know, keep it in frame. Uh, even if you have to set it down and go do some other stuff out of frame, keep it there so that people can see that you didn't swap out the locks. And that was uh, back in the day, that was probably the most common way to fake something. You yeah. would, you know, pin up a very easy, you'd pick it yeah. and then it would disappear. And then a second, almost identical one would appear with the real guts. It just sounds and, so lazy as an attack, as a way to like fake it. Well, <laughs> and you've got to wonder what the motivation is as well. Why would you do that? I mean, this is about uh, accomplishment, learning a skill and picking up techniques. This is not about showing off that, bam, I got it open. There you go. And then end video. But yeah. to me, that's never yeah. what this was all about. What are some well, other voices? More than a couple of times, I have thrown a video out after accidentally going out of frame. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> after I'm done, I'm about to post it and I, I review the video and, like, oh, darn, I went just out of frame for a split second. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. that's oh, all it takes. We got to reshoot it. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. I, I, I think it's. The, or I the battery the, dies. And it's like the battery's always waiting in the background to die at the least opportune time. I mean, right when you get that Eva 3KS <laughs> open for the first time in four years, you're like, I got it. And then, bam, out of frame. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> I, I, I think for me, I think for me, it's pretty obvious that my, um, uh, you know, my, my first influence in terms of learning uh, has to be on YouTube from, from Bill. And then uh, pretty much stumbled across various other pickers who were um, on YouTube around the same time, uh, Tumblr, um, yourself, um, Lock Picking Lawyer, um, What Is He Too? And then slowly sort of honed into um, other pickers like uh, Potty314, Potty Pie, um, who's a, a German picker. Uh, and what I liked about his videos was, was that he, he really injected a bit of humor into them and he went into a real deep dive into you know why a lock picked a certain way or, or you know and and for me that was like really um uh, really informative certainly influenced me in going probably into too much detail but hey and then um and then uh more recently um i i don't know if you know of a uh, talan pick uh, a, a wonderful spanish picker and 
and truly one of the most talented pickers out there on YouTube at the moment. And uh, his, his channel's really up and coming uh, in terms of um, its velocity. And um, he's he's just picking so much stuff. And and you know, to the point where um, he's influencing me because he he's sent me um, a whole bunch of um, Spanish dimple locks, which um, at the time I was okay at dimple lock picking, but you know he just keep, kept sending harder and harder ones. He sort of has been um, surreptitiously forcing me to become a better dimple lock picker without knowing it. <laughs> Very, so that's talent picker. Tal talent pick. Talent pick. Yeah. Um, a -L -L -A -A. Yeah. 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 Oh. He's um, really superb. Awesome. Very awesome. Now we talked about how you got into lock picking each one of you and how you were kind of inspired by various folk, but what about the next step? What about going from just a person at home to a person who's making videos and then sort of very regularly and very professionally making videos? Why did you want to, many people get into like shooting the video, not for the wide audience, I believe there's sort of, a, you know, again, in that community of proving you did it, uh, video has become the standard mechanism. Was it just that, or did you know from the start, you're like, ah, oh, maybe more people would want to see what I'm doing? That's an interesting question. Um, I started out more as an introduction of myself to the lock sport community than anything else. Um, I realized very quickly that this could be a very expensive hobby, and I wanted to introduce myself to other pickers so we could get to know each other and start trading locks. Mm -hmm. um, and the way to do that and let people know that you're not a, you know, an eight year old, um, typing on some forum was to, uh, was to actually start picking some locks online. And, uh, so I think that's why I first started making videos, mm -hmm. but pretty early on, I realized I wanted to make quite a few of them. So after the first I don't know, maybe 20 or something like that. I went back, started numbering my videos um, in anticipation that perhaps some lock maker would try to take them down. So it would be obvious if I ever did. Oh, um, that's brilliant. And, uh, and then things just started getting from there, although it was a very long time since I, until I ended up increasing my quality. So it wasn't embarrassing. <laughs> I remember my first video was in a motel room. I was traveling. I think I was in Peru somewhere. I got bored and I thought, you know what? You know, there, there were all kinds of videos out there where guys would pop locks, but they would never explain how they did it or what they were feeling or, you know, try to describe mm -hmm. the process. It just, it, at that time, it just didn't exist. So I took my Gen 1 iPad and I leaned it up against, I think it was a bottle of beer or something. And I did a silent movie. And I think for those of you who've seen my videos, I think the first two or three or maybe the first 10, they were all silent because I didn't have the coordination to do stuff, you know, to be picking and talk and think at the same time. I had to give it all of my energy. Mm -hmm. And over time, I guess that morphed. But you're talking about quality. I mean, those were really, really, by today's standards, really bad quality. And as time goes on, of course, you make changes, you adapt. People complain enough. I, you know, I'll, I'll listen and, I'm, and I make the fixes. But again, it, it's always been about the education part. I didn't want to just be one more guy who went on, popped a lock in one minute, and then ended the video. I wanted to. I wanted people to learn. I wanted to expand lock sport, and I thought that was the only way we we're going to uh, keep this thing alive. And it seems to have worked. I've been around for what seven or eight years now. Right on. And a number Definitely of people are going to get to the question. A generation of pickers. <laughs> We're going to get to the question of how people's video setup has evolved. No longer looks like it's, you know, as you said, filmed on a potato silently. But uh, Lock Noob, what, did, what made you start oh, recording yourself? Well, I just want to pick up on what uh, Bill said about his first videos. And um, I just have to say, YouTube never forgets. So when, when I first started, I, I didn't really know that there's a, a wider lock picking community or that this channel would last more than like two videos. I think I was basically trying to emulate Bill anyway. Sorry, Bill. And um, and uh, and they are bad. I mean, I think I had a, a sheet of like A4 printer paper as my backdrop in some of them. I mean, they are so cringeworthy, but some of them randomly got quite a lot of views, so they don't go away. And even if I try and replace those videos with much better ones with actual like, you know, real 
lock picking and stuff in it. it just <laughs> they still keep. I, I want to just say to YouTube, please, can you just like go to that one instead of this one, please? Because it's it, some of them are just so awful to watch now. But um, people still like them. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I started doing the uh, the, the channel to well, I was talking to my nephew and uh, I'm a best mate, and uh, you know, I said, oh, I've been doing some lock picking. They're like, oh, why don't you like you know stick it on YouTube so they can see it because they don't live near me. Um, I was like, yeah, sure. So I, I thought instead of just show a video of me picking a lock, I'd do something, um, you know, a, a bit like what I had seen on on YouTube. Um, and then I don't know it's kind of addictive, and it sort of spurred me on to do more videos. But yeah, I I just wish that I could replace some of them now. Well, there is a magic to some of the older content on some of the best YouTube channels, frankly. Um... I know that some of us, well, maybe later we'll talk about other YouTubers we all watch. There's a there's a scientist and engineer in Huntsville, Alabama. Called, he's got a channel called Smarter Every Day that I love. And one of his oldest videos is just him holding a chicken, just like moving a chicken around and its head stays still. He's talking about how that maps to different thrust forces. And, you know, by his modern standards, it's not his same production value, but I hope he never deletes it. Some of the old stuff shows where we've come from. And I like that. So I hope all you keep your old stuff up as well. But what made your videos start looking better? What kinds of upgrades or changes? They could be as simple as, you know, not using a bottle of beer, using a clamp arm, or did you? Did some of you invest in lighting or sound? Uh, what really made it feel to you? Like you're like, oh, thank God, I ordered this forty-five dollar thing on Amazon. This is night and day. <laughs> no, there's just one secret as far as I'm concerned. I generally use a fairly low quality camera. Um, but they punch well above their weight if your lights are good. So I have some, uh, I won't say they're particularly nice or expensive lights. There's just a lot of light here mm -hmm. um, where you can control the exact temperature of the light. Uh, you can control the brightness. Um, and, and that really allows you to make the most of your camera. And after that, just a decent microphone and uh, everything, everything else just falls into place. I mean, my setup is so basic. Um, I it's not that I'm lazy. I'm just like really busy, and uh, and I just I use my iPad Pro. I use my iPad Pro on a on a lectern, and that lectern is like uh, propped up by whatever books I can grab. Um, I, I initially started with a uh, like a ten pound external mic, thinking that would improve the sound quality, and then I soon realised it's actually dim the, the, the onboard microphone on the iPad was about 10 times better and all it was doing was making everything worse and only upgraded to um, I think a Blue Yeti mic um, about two years ago uh, and uh, the lighting is everything I'm really jealous of uh, Lockwood Lawyers lighting there because it, there's no hot spots you know and you can see the hot spots here on this reflection and it's just yeah I need to do something about my lighting but good lighting it takes a lot of space and I'm like in a corner of a room on a desk. So I, I think that the, the takeaway from me is you don't need a lot. You can, if you just have an iPad or a, a tab, any tablet really, you can record on it. You can do all the editing on it. You can do your uh, thumbnails, splash screens, animations, graphics. I mean, whatever you need, you can pretty much do on a, an, on a tablet these days. And you, you don't need a lot more than, you don't probably even need a microphone. You just need probably some half decent diffuse lighting of any kind and some way of recording and a passion. I think as long as you have that, people will watch. Yeah, you gotta have oh. that good splash screen, right? Splash screen and like a, a real, like a title that has a word all in all caps, you know, like, I was locked, destroyed by <laughs> new tool fix. <laughs> yeah, thumbnails are everything, <laughs> no question. I, uh, record, Bill? I, uh, I took a little bit different tack than Ash. Uh, let me, I'm gonna back this up here. I'm gonna show you what I have. I've gone through several different cycles. Um, first of all, my camera uh, right here, it is a, uh, it's a Sony, let's see, RX100. So I can record in HD. And then above it, I have a Neumann uh, TL103 microphone because I've had so much trouble getting good quality audio. Turns out it wasn't the equipment. I mean, I did soundproofing all around the entire wow. lab. It, it turned out it wasn't the equipment. It was my voice. I have what's, I'm not a singer, but it's called singer's voice. So at, at a certain frequency, and it took you know two years to figure this out, um, my vocal cords vibrate and people thought that was my microphone. And no, 
it's not. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that feeds that feeds into my digital recorder right there, which is a Zoom F4. Mm -hmm. And then I merge everything. I use Adobe to merge everything and into you know merge the video along with the audio. Oh. Oh, you you edit in yeah. Premiere or Premiere Rush or something or what? Uh, I use Premiere Pro. I use Audition to edit all the sound, and I use um, Premiere Pro. Excellent. Bill, I think products. we lost your feed. Did you? I don't see any picture. Any? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, you back with us. Okay. Anyway, that's what I've, I've gone the. I wish I, I wish I could have done it the cheap way, and and had I identified the voice defect, this, which is of course one of my many, many long list of defects, uh, early, then I could wouldn't have had to spend all this on all these cameras and mics and digital recorders and software and filters and. <laughs> Except so it sounds like, Bill, definitely you've just shown us, and I believe Lockpicking Lawyer, you've alluded to the fact that you have kind of a dedicated space where your setup just exists. Uh, Lock Noob, are you in the same boat, or do you have to, like, tear it down and set it up on the evenings when you want to record? Uh, no, I've got, like, one desk in my office. Half of it is the, 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 the like, PC keyboard and screen, and the other half is just, like, a permanent, uh, this is a floor tile. This is actually a ceramic floor tile. On my oh, desk, yeah, right on. yeah. I, <laughs> it's uh, I, like I said, I, I just do what I, I go. I go cheap, you know. I, I don't have a, I don't have a workshop. Um, I, I don't have a, a proper camera. I don't have uh, proper lighting. I just, I just go what I with what I can get away with. What my wife will let me have, <laughs> because I mean, <laughs> she, honestly, I, I, I hope she never looks under the beds to find all the boxes of locks she doesn't know about. I have an arrangement with my UPS guy. <laughs> he throws it behind my garage. <laughs> well, some people on, who are watching the stream are already asking about the things that you all have on your desks. People are asking if Bill is making picks right now. Oh. We have at least one person asking, is that a xenomorph on an on lockpicking lawyer's table? I don't know if they mean the doom sticker or the hunk of destroyed metal. And it looks like it looks like there's sort of a skeletonized uh, Gerber tool or something and some other tools on Lock Noob's bench. What are, some, what are some of the things that you've got hands-on while we're talking? I'm just keeping my hands busy. I thought while we were talking, uh, I have these picks. You guys know how hard I am on these things, and so I just thought I would clean them up. I got a couple of rejects I was going to replace, and then just taking the burrs off and using a pair of pliers to bend them back to close to the original shape. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> that and drinking. Absolutely. Well. I'm keeping my hands busy too, but this is what I do in all my spare time is just use one of these little hand exercisers. Um, as far as what I've got laid out here, um, we've got the uh, the Squire SS100 CS that uh, that Bill and I took to the, the gun range to see if Squire was being honest when they said this was the toughest lock in the world. And uh, this is what it looks like after was it 60 rounds of 556 five, NATO, 40 There's rounds of tip, right? 308 armor piercing, and then yeah. 20 rounds on the 20th round of 50 BMG, it finally opened. Wow. This is what it looked like when it started. And that's what's left. It's a, actually a modern art masterpiece, in my opinion. I think so. And, Those were, uh, now, that was a great crossover series of videos that the two of you did, right? Or you more than anything it was just a lot of fun yeah. <laughs> that was yeah, that a lot of fun a lot of attention and a lot of play in fact i'm familiar with a lot of you know the the firearms youtube world and they were all talking about it so you guys had, there was a lot of good results and a lot of thumbs up coming out of that work yeah that was well, a lot of fun it got me back on youtube's radar for demonetization i'll tell you that all of us i'd yeah, say about 50 percent of my videos got demonetized for the next three months until it finally what? fell off again <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah. You can't even say the word. You can't even use the word "gun" in your description without getting demonetized nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned. Um, Go ahead, lock you mentioned this, Yeah, you, you mentioned this uh, modified uh, tool. And it, 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 oh, look at that! I, I wish, I wish, I wish I could afford. Um, I wish I could afford Gerber. This was, I think, uh, what ten pounds, about fourteen dollars, um, and this is just like a one of those weird thought experiments. I always think. You know, if you've got an idea, just go for it because, I mean, what harm can it do? And, and this was like an idea for, um, so I made all these picks. This was the actual, uh, the uh, progenitor to um, uh, the Sparrow's gut wrench. Oh. Um, 
this I just made yeah. made, made that by hand. And this is all made out of um, a different thickness feeler gauge. And then the other side was um, I managed to get in some concentric tubing, which are actual uh, quarter inch and ten millimeter followers. Mm -hmm. And um, and this is this this gets so many uh, comments still on that video saying where can I get one? Where can I get one? Um, it's just like you can make one, um, but yeah, it's just like a like I said, a bit of a thought experiment. So that's what that was, and then all the rest is probably stuff we'll talk about later. That is very cool. That Thank is you, absolutely awesome. God damn. Yeah. But um, it's what it is way too it's, it's way too absolutely it's way nice. too big. You, you, somebody needs to actually <laughs> make this out of um, something which is you know more usable. But it's kind of cool. Along those lines, what what I carry every day is is a little fold up tool that I made out of the tool emergency card and just put a little rivet in the side so you can hold it together. They fold Ooh. out and it's a really nice little tool um, because it has some of the most useful profiles out there and uh, something you can fit in your wallet or your pocket very, very easily. Oh yeah. There's no weight penalty. It's really just uh, the best of all worlds, I think. It's either this or I wouldn't carry anything at all. Bill, do you have an everyday carry that's super tiny uh, pocket You know, size? I was hoping you wouldn't ask me. I'm standing here naked, and I just don't have any pockets right now. Well, uh, very good. <laughs> but speaking of tools, there have been some questions from the audience that some are leaning towards ones that we already wanted to mention. Uh, some, you know, some of the people in this, we've all made various degrees of custom tools. In fact, some of you have brought tools to the market, uh, and people wanted to know about that process. Any, you know, was it a good experience? Someone else was even asking about if Bill is sort of making or repairing tools. As you said, you're kind of you know keeping them tuned up. Uh, people are always curious, like people even of your caliber, do you damage tools? And how often when you're picking? And do they kind of go off to the side, kind of like clothing that needs to be mended? And then one, one day a week, you get out the sewing kit and patch all the holes in the socks. Do you kind of, all right, this pick needs some attention later. Do you, do you try to repair your tools and bring them back to life? Well, you've got two good questions there. The first has to do with manufacturing tools. And I'll let Harry deal with that one because he and I made a series of videos where we made this guy. In fact, here, here's the prototype. And then, of course, there's yeah. the one that Sparrow has finally put together. And we documented that because we knew it was going to be interesting. And uh, so we, Harry and I got together over a period of, how long was it, Harry? It was about a week, wasn't it? It, uh, yeah, just for the, the build process and design process between doing all of that and the amount we drank during that time period, uh, it took yeah, probably longer than it should. Yeah, <laughs> it, it could have been, it could have been a month, you know, <laughs> it, it was quite a process, but we would get together, we would make improvements and then Harry had gotten in a new lathe. And so, uh, we would come up with the improvements and then I'd basically leave and he would, you know, do the final tweaks. Next day, we'd get back together. So it was a lot of fun putting it together. And I think this was more, you know, when we came up with this, this was more to address a shortage in the marketplace. There just weren't any quality picks like this. And so uh, this is pretty much what Harry came up with. Yeah. It's a great idea. So, yeah. Uh, when you see Don't something. Say Harry. You know, there's, there's a lot of bill in there. <laughs> uh, and uh, Luck Noob, again, if you look at some of the stuff on his bench right there, you know, that goat wrench, uh, to me, that, that that was so obvious. Why didn't anybody come with it before, up with it before he did? It was just genius, um, particularly when we came up with those uh, master lock, you know, the handcuffs. And I had a heck of it. It took me two days to figure out how to tension it. And he did it in like five minutes when he came up with that wrench. Just amazing stuff. It's It really is a team effort. So that's a tubular turning tool, but the, the other side has that protruding bump, looks like. I don't recognize the long claw hockey stick foot going on there. Yeah, so um, hold on, let me uh, show you the, uh, there you go. So what it was is that there are some uh, tubular yes. locks. I don't, know whether I've, I don't know whether I've got one to hand, which don't have a cutout on right. these. They don't have the then indexing the, channel. The yeah, channel. so, so the, the only way to do it is by um, reaching down into the bottom of the lock and um, and grabbing it and this was the my thought process at the time uh, these are made out of by the way do you know the sparrows diy picks you can get these are actually made out of the handles because um i, I just you know whatever material works right yeah so I, I i tried that that was way too thin tried that and then i thought 
uh, well, it'd be great combined with that. And then, then uh, Sparrows and I kind of combined it and we made this. So there are, there are very few tubular locks um, that are the standard size that, that it, it can't open. So it's, um, and, and just out of interest, you know, it's like, it, it, you don't need any special equipment. All of these were made with a, uh, not even a brand, um, uh, like Dremel style tool. It's a, just a rotary multi-tool from China. Mm -hmm. um, you, you don't need a lot of equipment to just get an idea down. And it doesn't have to be right first time either. You can always redo it and redo it and redo it until it is. And, you know, sometimes you sometimes it hits, sometimes it misses. I think yeah. um, any, anyone thinking about bringing something to market or even, even kind of, it's not always the person who wants to do it. So, someone has a good idea and it's like their friend who is like, man, you should market that. That would be so easy and like everyone would love it. I think one of the, maybe you all would agree, the biggest confusion that people have is just how long it takes to bring something to the market if you really care about the quality. Because yeah. the iterative process of getting a prototype and then the manufacturers got a thing with his kid at school and then a month after that, because it's not really a retail product, they're just getting the prototype to you. And then like time just drags on and on and on sometimes. Yeah, you're hundred, and this is a perfect example. We, we went round and round with this guy because when we got it, it was bare metal. And here's, here's an example of one of the prototypes. Well, when you start sending it out, and, and I, I mean, we didn't have anything to do with it. Completely Sparrows did it. But I, I would imagine they have different machinists making the different parts. They weren't always, you know, they didn't always go together correctly. They didn't thread correctly. Had incorrect, you know, the, the fit here wasn't right. And then when all of that was perfect, and then they put the final finish on it, suddenly the finish wasn't quite what we wanted. So back to the drawing board. I mean, mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, we we wanted it done right up front. We wanted this to be the final answer to uh, detainer picks. And uh, Harry was even pickier than I was, but we were determined not to let it go out the door. And luckily, because we had basically donated uh, the entire design to Sparrows, we had a little bit of say in it. That was really amazing, though, the the idea. And we again, not everyone is in the same financial position. A lot of us are kind of privileged to have nice, you know, income. But it was still, nonetheless, a very lovely gesture that you were able to do when you kind of released it to the world. You just you cared much more about the design living and being out there in people's hands than you cared about like a Mercedes in retirement or something like that. That was very, very awesome. <laughs> of you and the community really owes you a debt. Well, one of the challenges with this was, was to make it at a at a price point because there's always great products out there for someone who can spend some money. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's still the case. If you want the very best, you're probably going to uh, to Matt. It goes by Huxley, Huxley yeah. Pig over in the UK, who hand builds these incredible tools. They go by the silver bullet, I think mm -hmm. is his, his moniker on most of those. In fact, but this yeah, was something go. that was there you go yeah, this just came in that just came in two days ago this oh, is we got two of them yeah products. hucks makes some quality game. what is it with england you got hucks you've got john fall who's been making government picks at government prices for a very long time yeah we've got, uh, we got gj locks as well um yeah. we've got andy mack we've got a lot of yeah a lot of great tool makers i, I don't know yeah I, I don't know what this thing is but um yeah it's really cool looking <laughs> but but one of the one of the challenges here was a something that would be usable by a relative beginner, um, which almost certainly dictates top of the keyway or not top but front of the keyway tension, yeah. because the bottom of the keyway ones are a little bit harder to use. Um, but also, we wanted this at a price point. We didn't want another you know three, four, five hundred dollar tool we wanted something 50 bucks that mm -hmm. you know while certainly not cheap something that would be able to be accessed by pretty much anyone um and that's what we we're aiming for for this and to be able to open a lot of locks and i think we did a pretty good job with it i'm happy with it it's, i agree uh, yeah i, I couldn't be happy all the time um, yeah, yeah, but, but that was well, twitch really asked how well they're selling do you know if Sparrows can keep them in stock. I know they all sold out the first announcement, right? Are they back in stock again? Yeah, well, I've talked to uh, Sparrows about that recently. And uh, they obviously, they sold out in about 40 minutes, the first round of, it was over a thousand of them. Um, they have the parts for a lot more, but there's bottlenecks with finishing. With coronavirus, everyone's closed down. Mm -hmm. um, they use a lot of um, 
manufacturers that work with the auto industry for finishing their metal parts. And, uh, and they're all closed down right now. So my understanding is they have the parts for a lot more, um, but there's some bottlenecks with getting them finished. The, uh, the finish on these is not just, you know, some sort of simple chemical process or paint or anything like that. It's some sort of actual, you know, black metal oxide coating mm -hmm. uh, that's not going to be particularly easy for them to replicate in house. Right so the mag phosphate they, they will have a lot more of them, but, but it's going to take some time for, uh, for the world to, to reopen. Well, everyone, everyone's still thrilled with it. So we'll keep, if you don't have one yet, sit tight, everyone <laughs> online, you'll be able to get one, I promise. It's not like yeah. a one who makes the pack a punch and then they went out of business when the man passed away. So no, I've got I mean, from my, I, I feel like such a slacker. The latest thing I've tried to bring to market is this little card. Um, this is just freaking etched plastic. I don't know if you can see, but it's for, um, you've seen decoder cards, right? Mm. Well, these yeah. are keys and pins. So it's like Schlage key, Schlage pin, Schlage master pin, quick set keys and pins, master and American keys and pins. So, you know, it's for gutting a lock in the field. Uh, you can usually find a pretty reliable key gauge and like, you know, American key supply, other people make really big, fat, weird pin gauges, but no one had made a, an all-in-one. So one of these days, this again, just prototype life, right? I've got a couple of these on my desk. One of these days they'll show up somewhere, but we all have uh, shit we're working on. <laughs> um, I just want to say that uh, having, you know, being independent of the, the creators, um, I have to say I've used this and it really is just brilliant. Um, yeah, I can't wait for more people to get hold of these because it, it's actually opened up uh, the, the ability to pick more locks. And that's rare for a tool. A lot of people have other workarounds, uh, but some locks just were not really possible to pick um, in a convenient manner. Uh, just due to, if anything, this 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 tip, uh, the yeah. the fact that it can lengthen and shorten, it's just little little things like that can make a difference between um, never being able to open a lot and actually being able to open a lot. So you know this this really has made um, you know a, a big leap in in you know lock sporting. I think it's uh, it's a great tool. So uh, thank you, um, Bill I need, and Harry. I need to make sure Bill gets credit there. The very first prototype did not have an extendable tip. It just had a really long tip. Um, and Bill was the one who had first suggested that, you know, hey, we've got a lot of room in the back. Let's just counter drill that and make it so it can can be telescoping. And, uh, and that was a really great idea. Well, I, uh, and again, it's one of those things you stumble on by accident. Um, the thought process behind that was that if it, breaks, which I break stuff all the time, getting to the second half of your question, um, the idea would be that we'd be able to repair it quickly so people would not have to buy an entire new tool. As it happens, um, the lock manufacturer started to beat the old pick, started putting their keyway deeper and deeper inside of the lock. And by coincidence, that extendable tip, it just worked out. It's very fortuitous. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I wish you could say, I wish I could say that was the way we planned it. But uh, that's just the way it worked out. Um, uh, you mentioned tools, breaking stuff. Yes. I mean, I get that question all the time. I break, well, I don't usually break things unless it's like a tension wrench that will break catastrophically when I'm really putting the torque to it. So I don't break things a lot, but what I do is I really bend my picks a lot. And I don't know, this is one I've decided to do a reject on because it's just not repairable. You notice how it's got that little bow right there? And I take a pair of pliers about, like you said, about once a week, I grab it and very gently try to bend it back. But after you do that two or three times, metal fatigue sets in and you just got to look at it and say, I don't want that to break off inside of a, a lock because then I got to throw the lock away. So you got to throw the pick away. So there's that balance. I just bend them back, twist the tip back in place and then put it back in the rack. This one's got to go. He's a little bit too far gone, I think. Is that one but, you made, or is that a manufactured pick? No, this is a this is a manufactured one. I think yeah, this is a multi pick one. So mm -hmm. I try to stick with you know you, you'll see a variety. You you guys have seen my pick rack before. I've got a variety of manufacturers in there. I just pick a style, or I choose a style of pick that I like. For example, I really like this guy. This one happens to be from Sparrows. I just really like that tip. So I buy those from Sparrows and I find other ones. I look for quality 
uh, tools. Again, it's, you know, you, you buy something. It's like that laser we were talking about earlier, you know, rather than buy a crappy laser and then spend a lot of money to improve it, just spend your money up front, get a quality tool. And that way you don't have to throw away a bunch of locks because the picks broke off and inside the keyways. Yeah. So I, I try yeah, to recycle tool that. I'm sorry. I was going to say a tool. It's pretty rare for me to, uh, to destroy lock picks anymore. Um, I destroyed a ton in the very beginning with my uh, crazy heavy tensioning. Um, but I probably destroyed more picks in the first six months I was picking than I have since then. Um, but there's one thing that I do damage all the time, and it's these little uh, little shim feeler gauges. They're about seven thousandths of an inch thick. They're oh, yeah. awesome for mm. decoding and opening some some locks. But this is actually something that I don't think I've shown in public before, and that was a way I've developed for uh, for fixing these. So let's just go ahead and bend this in a really stupid way. It's kind of what can happen. I have this pair of pliers. It's meant for jewelry makers to bend circles into little pieces of wire. And I just put it on the end and, and pull it down and bend it. You can see it, it curves and then I'll go the other way and go back and forth a few times. And then eventually I'll just get it back to, to being straight. And, uh, and you can go from a damaged, ready to go in the trash tool into something that is absolutely perfectly usable again. And you can probably do that about 10 times before the tool has to be thrown away. And given that these are, you know, depending on the brand, 10 to 20 bucks a piece, um, this saves me a ton of money because I go through these a lot and fast. That's very cool. That is um, a good idea. I, I, I can honestly, count the number of uh, lock picks I've broken in the four years and it's actually weirdly four and all of those were um, at least in the first two years of lock picking I just want to show um, three different brands there but these are all picks that are at least um, three and a half years of picking and these are my most commonly used picks uh, they have been bent back a bit but um, I agree with Bill if you just get good quality tools to begin with you you probably will save some money in the end. But then again, there are some like uh, really good lock picks out there. Um, they're not like fantastic quality, but they're like a couple of pounds for a whole set. And you've got to think, you know, if you don't have a lot of money, you can still do a lot of good lock picking. And if you do break them, you can just buy the whole new set for a couple of extra pounds. So it's, it is that way up. But I think if, you, if you're really serious into lock picking, it definitely helps to get some decent quality tools from a, a, a well-known manufacturer. But I don't think that should put you off getting into lock picking there are some surprisingly good value sets out there for not very much money which are relatively easy easily replaceable if you are on a budget that's fantastic and i think half of us including myself are now looking on amazon for jewelry heating and bail bail wire setting flyers thank you Mark. uh speaking of things that break i mean what do you do if uh you're shooting a video and you have a failure condition how many times do you, some of you, like I know, for example, uh, I, I didn't realize it that, you know, your commitment until we were filming a couple of clips together, lockpicking the lawyer, like you're, you're do it in one. You're like, no, like, even if like the, 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 whatever's happening goes well, even if you misspoke a word, you're like, oh, I kind of didn't like, let me do that again. Cause you don't want to have to ever trim anything. How many of you deal with like you maybe you had a really rare lock or like, oh, I really want to include that footage, but that thing at the end where I spilled the drink, like, what do you do with failure conditions when you're shooting? No, my, uh, I usually go through uh, several takes of a video um, and it's not for the reasons that people would think. If I, if I just said that, people would think, oh, you failed to pick the, uh, the lock, so you started over and you did it again. And uh, Dave, I know you've seen me pick in person, so you can, you, you oh, can yeah. at least verify that, that, I'm not, that that's not something that, that, I, that I would need to do. No, not really. No, um, he's just perfectionist about his presentation. No, if people look at the format of my videos, there's a ton of talking up front. There is a lock picking demonstration, and then there is a very short summary outro at the very end. And the reason it's done like that is, you know, I know I can nail the picking. I know if I keep it short enough, I can nail the outro. Um, 
But that beginning portion where I talk about the lock, um, that's what I spend all my time trying to get just right. And I'll go through that you know, as many as 10 times before I get the wording exactly the way I'd like it. I get the, the cadence the way I'd like it. Um, that's honestly the hard part of the video for me. Yeah. I How think I take the other people I, do. I take a slightly different approach. I'm a little lazier, I think. Um, I what you see is the way it happens. Uh, if I misspeak, everybody misspeaks, and I just hope that you know my viewers understand that. I would rather be honest up front. When if I have a failed pick, uh, I'm going to show it. If I drop something, which I do all the time, um, I'm in fact I'm kind of infamous for my my massacres of guttings because they never seem to be right, especially when it's a new lock. I mean, I don't pre-gut something to see how it's done. I want you to learn from my mistakes. So if I pop it open and all kinds of stuff springs out of there, like Jack in the Box, then that would probably have happened to you too. And I want you to learn from my mistake. And I'm too lazy to edit it out. And if you edit it out, people are gonna say, oh, you know, it's, it's too perfect. You're kind of faking the video. And I don't, you know, I really don't wanna go have that accusation out there. Uh, I want you, I want new pickers in particular are sensitive to, you know, matching their skills to what they see on the screen. And if they see nothing but perfection, if they see every lock opening on the first try, then that's what they expect from themselves. And that's not reality, at least in my world. Uh, so often you'll see me start a pick and I'll say, well, you know, I must have overset that or whatever. And you'll see me recock it and I'll just start picking it again. And now that results in longer videos. I get it. But I'd rather have a slightly longer yet realistic video and not discourage a potential lock sporter. So say, I can't do that. I quit. I'm out. Mm -hmm. I, I'm somewhere between the, the two, really. Uh, I, I sabotage most of my own videos. I have to say that I, I've, I've reshot some videos, oh, way over 10 times just because um, I, I start going off and then something will happen I'll just like I'll run out of things to say or I'll slur a word or say something stupid I'm, and, and I know it sounds really uh, silly but um, when you're just a pair of hands and you're prone to making as many kind of verbal mistakes as I am I, would, I just want to try and get like one of the pickings where uh, you know it at least sounds right you know and um, I, I'm not really a perfectionist in the way that I, I pick a lock. I think if you've ever watched my videos, you know, I'm not out there to, you know, pick crazy hard locks in two seconds. Um, uh, I probably just don't have the skills to do that anyway. It's, you know, but so you, you've got to try to mix that um, honesty, but also a bit of entertainment as well. You know, I, I want to talk about the lock. I want to get the picking done. And I don't, I, I try to keep my videos as tight as I can. And even then they they can be pretty long. So for me, it's just striking a balance between that kind of honesty, um, clarity, and and entertainment too. Uh, but I, I don't want anybody to think that there isn't a lot of practice involved. Um, I think there is. I'll I'll be probably playing with that lock for um, I don't know half an hour, an hour before I start to record. Mm -hmm. So you know, this isn't like oh, I'll just pick this random lock up. I'm just going to pick it now. No, it's, it's never that. You know, it's, I think. Um, most of us, I'd, I'd probably say, spend some time with a lock first, get to know it, gut it, maybe put it back together, um, and, and just try to understand it before we, we go for the record. But yeah, um, and then there are just some locks um, like uh, like this one, which um, know when they're on camera, and you can pick you can pick it a hundred times, and you'll be ready to go. You'll turn the camera on. And, yeah, locks and, do not cooperate. That's for sure. And, and, and whilst and, and whilst to be very honest to show me, you know, fight a lock for a whole hour um, and, and crying at the same time. I don't think that's going to entertain many people. That's where you get one of those secondary channels where you're like lock noob two. <laughs> you put all your <laughs> like technology connectors. You put all your extra stuff there that's long form and you still get views, trust me, I bet. Uh, speaking well, I of lock failures on, on that, camera, what's that? Well, well I, I was gonna say, say lock uh, noob, can you bring that Zeta lock back? <laughs> I was gonna say that, uh, that's one of the ones that uh, that came that I tried out of Bill's naughty bucket. I remember them well because I had one and I did a video on it. And then probably a year later, Bill gave me one says, I can't pick this. And I was thinking, oh, you know, this is going to be no problem at all. And I probably spent three hours trying to open one of those. 
Yeah. I have four other Zeta locks with the exact same core I can open in a minute or two. It was, um, it, I found the key for that here. It, it, it was the bidding. It was crazy. Was it? Yeah. There's, and I got, there's I got something about little. that one lock. That was yeah, the one I pulled the core out of. <laughs> they overset, they overset like crazy. They, they oh, are, yeah. they, yeah, they, they, you've got to be there's, so light with those. Well, yeah, there's something you, about locks. Go ahead, Larry. Harry. I was going to say, you can never say, yes, I can pick that. Um, at best, you can look at a lock and say, I picked them before. I can probably pick that one. But uh, but that Zeta lock, that that taught me a hard lesson. Yeah. <laughs> that one uh, yeah. that one was humbling. <laughs> now, is that exact Zeta lock one that one of you traded with, with each other? Or how did you get that? Um, I think I just loaned it. I loaned him a whole bunch of locks. He picked through my... Uh, my naughty bucket and and chose foolishly chose that one <laughs> i'd been trying it for two years yeah. never got it open once when he gave <laughs> it back when he told me he couldn't pick it and he's a better picker than i am that's the one i use in the demo for the core puller i pulled the core i got it open <laughs> it wasn't oh, entirely you? fair Excellent. but i got it open that, Speaking that of breaking of things and, and other videos of, of things going awry, one of our good friends, uh, Locksmith and Lockpicker, Rubber Band, he had asked, Bill, there was something about a video where you posted you broke your arm. Is that part of uh, like biking and lockpicking or was there any more oh, detail that you didn't share about that? Uh, that was funny. Uh, yeah, well, my very first video before I even started, po before I even posted my first lockpicking video, uh, I had a YouTube channel. I didn't really have, know what to do with it. So I had a helmet cam on, while I was out mountain biking and I ended up having a pretty bad crash. I broke, yeah, I broke a lot of bones on that one and I, I ruined a perfectly good we wheel on my bike too. But uh, yeah, that was my first video, the bike crash. But well, you're doing better now. Yeah. And then l later I did videos on, uh, I think I called it bike picking where I would ride my bike and pick locks at the same time. <laughs> so I got better. <laughs> you learned your lesson well, obviously. Not at I all. Guess. Uh, talking about, you know, making videos, I, a lot of people don't realize, you know, they see a one or two minute video and they think, well, it just took one or two minutes. But in fact, there's a lot of videos, at least around the lock lab that uh, are failures, 100 percent failures. So for every, you know, 10 minute video you see, there's many other failed videos. And here's one. I mean, I, I rolled up a piece of foil here and I was so convinced I could get this to work to impression tubular lock, just a rolled up piece of foil. And I fought this thing for probably more than a week, you know, trying different tips, trying to fasten it, trying different layers of foil, different types of foil. And it never worked. I have probably 20 hours of total failure video. You know, that's the kind of thing you're never going to see. It's a great mm -hmm. idea. It just didn't quite work out. I've got, I've got a brilliant example of a great idea that didn't work out. This is one of my uh, finest, uh, uh, in terms of like a craftsmanship uh, picks that I made, I really wanted to make this uh, a heartbeat. Peaky. Yeah, heartbeat. It's going to be called the flatline. I mean, it even had like a name, you know, it's a heartbeat. Yeah. It's a flat line. Uh, and, and this thing does not work in any single lock. It canyons. <laughs> it, uh, it, 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 I mean, if you want to snap a pick off in a lock, and uh, then this is absolutely it. But I mean, it's a, it was a wonderful idea. It just uh, was terrible, terrible. It's a shame because it looks so <laughs> cool. I know, right? That does look pretty cool. <laughs> so people were asking about getting ideas for videos. We just talked about how some of you will trade locks with one another. Uh, I know a lot of people on this uh, panel look at eBay occasionally for obscure things. And sometimes you, I don't know if anybody, in Tool, I know we would have times where people would be either on the forums and we had that or the Slack being like, all right, I'm the one bidding on this. What are, what are you sons of bitches doing? But stop bidding. Is that, is that you bidding on this? Do you, where do you search for your locks? Do you rely, some of your videos, do they come from people sending you locks? Do you like when that happens? Do you not? I'll be the first. I love well, it when people send locks to me. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Yeah, I, I shop around on eBay. I look on a lot of the boards and forums. I ask friends. I still have, I don't travel so much overseas anymore, but I still have a lot of friends that do. So if they're going to a country I've never been to before, I ask them, please, you know, here's a hundred dollars, please go to the hardware store and buy one of every lock that they have. I mean, I, I just like getting weird, unusual locks to try out. And if people want to send them in, I, I always 
welcome that. You know, after I think I have around 1700 videos now. Yeah. Um, the ideas continue to flow. I'll be doing something and I'll say, hey, that might make a good video or someone. And this happens more often than anything else. Someone will send me an idea and I think, wow, why didn't I think of that? And so I'll make a note and then it always goes on my to do list. So I'm constantly looking for new locks, but I'm always willing to listen to any good ideas for videos. Yeah, I'll, I'll second. I, I love it when people send me locks. I put my, my PO box in the, uh, the about chat, uh, tab of my channel. Uh, the one thing I would ask is just do a quick search before you send them. I've had so many locks, nice locks that people have sent me that, uh, I've already featured before. And, um, I don't like to, to double dip unless there's something mm -hmm. new I've discovered about the lock or there's been some change. So when you send me something I've already done, well, I really can't do much with it. Um, I'm someone who spends a ton of time on eBay looking for interesting locks. And uh, if you were outbid on something, there was a fair chance it was me. Um, <laughs> I spend an embarrassing amount of money <laughs> on, <laughs> on eBay. That's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not a, it's not pretty when, when, <laughs> When I put my taxes together this last year and tried to figure out exactly how much money I spent on locks, my uh, my wife gave me a very stern look. <laughs> but um, well, I'm always looking for stuff. something. Yeah, for the, for the most interesting stuff, and I have you know literally over a hundred searches, always running on eBay for for interesting locks that give me alerts whenever anything pops up. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the lock I just featured in a video today, uh, which is this one, it's a, uh, a bathroom pay toilet lock. Yeah. This is the culmination of a search running on eBay for over a year before one popped up at a price that I was willing to pay. Um, this was definitely one of the, uh, the eBay long game locks I had. Uh, I just think they're so interesting and there's so many interesting quirks and features to them. Um, I just couldn't get one in my hands. Um, and I'm kind of disgusted now that I think about it, but, uh, the number Wash of hands filthy hurt. hands that touched that lock <laughs> over the years. Um, but you know, sometimes you have to play the long game on eBay and, uh, and just having a lot of searches running helps with that. And I think, uh, how much, uh, do you try to work in advance and find oh. out something you use? Uh, so so sorry um Devin, what, what was the question oh you know well so like the cartoonist who made peanuts charles schultz he famously was always like seven to eight weeks ahead of deadline on his comic strips so how far in advance do you like search and have a backlog of things ready to film are you like these oh, guys with a, a lot of content in the drawer still yeah so i think i'm on what around 700 videos or something like that and um i, I used to be filming like a uh, what two or three videos a week the day before they were, they were published and it, it got to really really become so stressful after a while mm -hmm. um then i realized that actually you know you can film in batches and um yeah. i only have a couple of nights a week where i can either practice or film so sometimes i'll spend a whole evening practicing then another whole evening filming um i look forward to doing reviews because um i could i can do a review in like half an hour maybe a couple of takes but you know that's like that's relaxing time um but you know I, I try to i try to do two picking videos in a week and then on the weekend do something different whether it's uh, me making something doing a demo um a tutorial or review you know i try to mix it up but it's always always good having some in the bank in fact i've got about 40 videos that are unpublished some over a year old uh which is really weird but um I sometimes just publish what I feel like, and that's quite nice to go into your library and go, you know what, I haven't done a, a leave a lot video for a while, so I'll publish this one, or, ah, yeah, that review, or, you know, it's kind of nice to mix it up, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with um, Harry and Bill there with, with locks. It's fantastic to get locks from, from people. Um, you know, people just email me, and uh, and and we'll have a discussion about it, because I, I don't like to take something off somebody if I've already picked it or I already have one. Um, so, so that, that's always nice, but yeah, I think we're all on eBay. Um, in fact, I think most of my first years worth of locks were actually borrowed off um, one of the 
uh, moderators of the UK Lock Sport Forum, UCOF, and he he just said he found out where I roughly lived and, and said, "Hey, I live near you," and he just brought along pretty much his entire lock collection at the time and said, "Here you go, you can borrow that." Um, so yeah, he like. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and then I realised at the time, oh, there's a community. So, so now uh, a lot, a lot of like trading is going back and forth between um, a lot of my peers on YouTube, um, people in forums, uh, 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 you know, just friendly people on Twitter. It's, 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 it's a really fantastic community. But it is, as ever, hard to get new locks, uh, things people haven't seen before, and, um, and and get them there. So I think we all appreciate um, any assistance we get. Yeah. Fantastic. Speaking I of content, and, those circumstances, yeah. you've got you know hundreds more videos than me. Um, we, we've probably featured a lot of the same stuff over the years, um, but you know I know how hard it is after eleven hundred videos to uh, to find new, fresh video ideas. After uh, I can only imagine how much harder it's going to be after another six hundred videos. Well, you know, <laughs> so you guys you have got my. Uh, Maybe maybe I should start doing some blooper videos. <laughs> now, do you folk all have pretty easily findable like email addresses or methods of contact if people want to send you things to, to like a, a PO box or wherever you receive packages? It should be. I mean, the the about tab of my YouTube channel has has everything, and you know, lock picking lawyer at Gmail is pretty. It has been out there for a while. Right on. I will note that I get, uh, I'd say a light day is over a hundred emails um, mm -hmm. and replying to them all is really very difficult. And I hate that because I love interacting with people. It used to be, I replied to every single comment left on my YouTube channel. Um, that obviously stopped being possible a long time ago, even if it was something just to say thanks for commenting or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so then that went away and then, um, and now it's, it's turned to emails where, you know, I hate, you know, someone's taken the time to email me and if I don't reply, it's just, it would be an absolute full-time job for me to reply to all the emails I get. Um, yeah. So I, I apologize to anyone listening out there. If, if you sent me an email and I didn't reply, um, you know, there's just only so many hours in the day. Thank you for sending them. But yeah, I well, I think that was ballistic you know, gamer and a few and other people on the stream were, were curious about trying to send you all some things. So I think maybe a very safe rule for ballistic gamer or anyone else who was saying that um, get in touch with them first. But even if you find an address, as some of them have pointed out, like getting duplicates is always cool, but you can't sustain a channel with the same lock over and over, even if it's rare. So reach out as briefly as you can. How many people like, oh, my God, just from my own perspective, maybe you all feel me. White space. Oh, my God. White space in an email. If an email is just like all text, I'm like, oh, I'm going to read that later. And then I, <laughs> yeah. yeah, reach out yeah. to them, tell them what you have. <laughs> And uh, they'll, they'll tell you how to ship it to them. And don't feel bad if they've already had a video somewhere because they have thousands of videos online. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm like Harry. I think in my descriptions of all my videos, I've got my email address, BosniaBill1 at Gmail. And then I think the mailing address is also there. But yes, please, uh, please don't send me a master lock or, you know, a Schlage or anything like that. I mean, contact me first. I'm, I'm always happy to receive locks, but I don't want to waste your time or your money to mail me stuff that won't be featured. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my uh, my email address, uh, locknoobcontact at gmail.com is in every video description um, that I have. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's really good to get stuff, but uh, emails and comments. Um, and bear in mind, you know, I don't have anywhere near the subscriber base as um, Bill or Harry. And I try to reply to every email and every comment. And at the moment, I think it's taking me six hours a week uh, to do that. So it's, it's getting to the point where, uh, you know, even with my channel, it, it's becoming somewhat unsustainable. But it's really addictive, too, because there are a lot of um, uh, people that I see across all our channels who make the effort to, to comment and be part of that community. So I, I sort of want to keep doing that. But uh, there's going to be a, a, a point where... Uh, it will become impossible without, you know, it'll impact my life in, in, in a negative way. 
Um, I don't think it's sustainable to spend much more than six hours a week replying to to, to comments. So, um, you know, it, it might have to change, but uh, I think there'll always be a, a, a bit of me that feels sad if that ever did happen. Um, but yeah, this, this is just this is just a point where you can't. I get it. I get it. And for anyone who doesn't know, I am always deviant at deviating.net if you want to send me pasta sauce recipes or naked pictures of your cats. But uh, going back to the viewer questions for a second, someone, Mr. Spokes says, are there any more plans to bring the RAM set back into more videos? I, I know the RAM set, I don't think it's gone away. In fact, it's upgraded. You've got the new heavy power one. Uh, I'm a Do as you want to show your scar? <laughs> oh yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's doing pretty well. It's, it's healed up. You really can't see it much now. It's the lighting doesn't. You yeah, know, it's, I was it's just a little bit of something going on there. I was down at the Red Team Alliance Training Center, and uh, it was the end of a, a week long class, and we thought, hey, it'd be fun to break the ram set out, and uh, it worked brilliantly, except for the fact that the lock flew across the room and took a piece of Dave's uh, elbow out. Are you bringing the frame? You frame the lock. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. That guy. Uh... Yeah, and some whoever but... whoever's Ella, whoever's heart we broke when Rob uh, got this off the bridge. That was we we'll call that Ella's revenge. Ella came flying at me from across the room. Yeah, Rob loves, or, or I guess he hates love locks. <laughs> <laughs> he has a he has a patch. Um, I don't think I have it handy with me. That anyone who gives him a love lock that was taken from a bridge, he will give them a that patch. Yeah. It. Oh my God! Yeah, it's, thank you for it's always it, good. It's to one see of three. He's got the uh, the T Rex challenge that you get this patch for, and that is lock picking while you have a. Uh, a TENS machine, one of those electroshock therapy machines hooked up to your arm muscles. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's called the, then there's one called Mace Face, which I also have, but I don't know where it is. And it's where you play the, uh, that game that, that you, I don't know, you turn a knob in a certain yeah. number of clicks and it puts a pie in your face. I guess maybe Pie Face is the name of the game, yeah. but he sprays the pie with uh, pepper, pepper spray. <laughs> <laughs> um, and makes that a, uh, a lock picking challenge. And I think the third one is, is the heartbreaker where you have to go, uh, go take a love lock off a, uh, off a bridge. So absolutely. Uh. Well, speaking of, uh, things that are good ideas or bad ideas, uh, frosty Jimbo is asking about whether, and again, this we're going to caveat. None of us are lawyers in the criminal. We're, some of us are lawyers, but we're not your lawyer. Um, <laughs> is it legal or okay to pick an apartment door that I'm leasing, but I don't own? So, so, I mean, I think a lot of us have pretty clear answers on this, but who wants to take it first? That's a really bad idea. I'm going to take yeah. that one for a couple of reasons. A, you don't own the lock. B, there's a really good chance that lock is master keyed. And when there's master wafers in a lock, there is a really, really good chance that an amateur is going to destroy that lock. When you turn a lock cylinder 180 degrees, where the bottom of the cylinder is facing the driver pins, what happens is those, uh, those master wafers will drop out into the keyway and you can actually change the bidding of your lock where neither the master key or the, the tenant key will work on that lock anymore. So A, never pick locks you don't own, even if it's your own apartment, but B, if it's an apartment, if there's a commercial lock, any place where there's a chance of master cane, the, the chances of you destroying that lock such that a locksmith will need to come and repair it are very, very high. So you heard it first from lock picking lawyer. Do not pick the lock on your door. It could be mastered. Take it apart and decode it and get the master key for the building. <laughs> I'm not sure he said that Cheers. exactly. <laughs> I don't know. Something crazy in my ear. I read your book though, but I don't think just, he said that. Just paraphrasing. <laughs> no, it, it, I mean he is right. Uh, it. Oh, look, there's a copy of the book. Banging. Cool, cool. Uh, wow, what kind awesome. of a guy? Oh my god. Yep. Got them all. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, I hate to say it. What it comes down to is if, let's say, it wasn't you sticking something in your door, um, 
you know, Jimbo, if it was something, if just dirt got in the door and the lock stopped working, would it be you pulling out a credit card to pay for the technician to service it? Or would it be part of like your management company's job to kind of fix that? If it's not your money to fix someone else's like causes a problem, you shouldn't be the one causing the problem because it's someone else's money and effort uh, that, it, that, is, that is solving it. And let's look at it from practical perspective as well. Let's say you decide to pick your apartment door lock and you do screw it up. Well, now all of your stuff, you can't lock it up. And yeah. you got to find a way to fix your door or get somebody to guard it while you go find a lock or get a locksmith in there. I mean, it just, it just doesn't make sense. Locks, just go buy the lock from Home Depot to begin with and don't screw around with your apartment door. Or you and can't unlock it. I've had that happen where people... I, so many of the emails I get are people who have screwed a lock up and say, help, I screwed, I screwed up my door lock. You know, one of the failure modes is they managed to pick it, but they dropped a master wafer out and yeah. now their key doesn't work anymore and they right, can't exactly. get into their own apartment. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. And none of us, we're not hand waving away the, the thrill, right? Like when you, especially new pickers, when they learn this stuff, you start walking through the world and seeing things around you in a new light. And you're like, I can pick that. I bet I can try to pick that. So we all get it. We really understand. But it's just like, you know, when you get your first 22 rifle as a kid, you can't just go out plinking at like road signs and think because they're there. Like that. I understand that you want to, but you can't. That's not, it's not responsible. Mm -hmm. uh, not so I think we all can agree with that. <laughs> Not so civil engineer asks, uh, again, this is sort of in terms of the moral tone and the way we, um, like the, the notable figures like yourselves kind of contribute to the dialogue of the community. What about stereotypes about certain brands that the lock sport community and some of its prominent voices, whether you meant to or not, do you feel that there's has now become a larger stereotype around certain brands as being the end all be all good locks or like master lock, you know, obviously master lock has taken a lot of heat because they coasted for a very long time, uh, confident in their in their market segment. Uh, do you feel any responsibility around that dialogue? Are you happy with how the dialogue has gone? Um, I'll jump in on that. And I, you know, yeah, you've had the best dialogue with them. <laughs> well, having having been sued, <laughs> having been sued by Master Lock or attempted to be sued. <laughs> I'm, I don't regret the things that I've said about some of the lock manufacturers. There are some and remain some pretty bad locks, low quality, easy to pick locks out there. But Divya, you said something a minute ago. With those of us who have taken the time to get the skill to learn how to pick locks, we get that feeling of, um, it's almost like a feeling of power about how I, I, I can now pick that. I, I can defeat that without a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. And that is based on, on a lot of practice. It's based on you know getting the right tools and taking the time to learn how to do it. Only a tiny fraction of the population can do that. Let's face it. Mm -hmm. So when I see a lock like this, we make fun of these, and they're you know they're physically very tough locks. They're pretty simple locking mechanisms. But if there's one comment that I and I'm sure all of you have heard this a thousand times in your own comments, you know locks are only intended to keep an honest man honest. Please don't ever say that again in a comment, but uh, it's true. This does Amen. a great job of keeping 99.9% .9 of the people out of whatever you're trying to keep them out of. But it's that 0.1% of us who've taken the time to learn how to pick, how to gather those skills, get the tools together. You know, we look at it, we make fun of this, and we now look on these as these are training locks. These are very rudimentary, very crude training locks. But if you're a new picker, there's nothing more valuable than having something like this available. Try to imagine if they did away with it, what would we do for a training lock? Um, yeah, I'd be stripping <laughs> apart cylinders and making progressives all day long. Yeah, uh, yeah I guess that's true. These are going to be around forever. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think also as lock pickers, we um, over overestimate the the value of having a, a pick resistant lock. Um, Harry, you did a, a a very successful series on you just using a monkey wrench to, to break apart these locks. When I was broken into, they left the locks alone and just pried the hasps off. Um, I think as lock pickers, we were so obsessed with um, whether a lock is easy to pick or not. We actually don't think about the, um, uh, the, the overarching security about 
you know, hiding, you know, making sure the, the shackle is uh, well hidden, that the, the hasps that they're attached to are actually strong, that the, the wood that is, you know, on the, the door is also strong, that you have um, strong windows, other security devices, good lighting, it's a whole host of things. And, and it's not just all about the lock. Um, then again, uh, this is a master lock 19, I think, which was uh, given to me by Leon's Lockpad, another um, a UK channel, and uh, and I've not been able to pick this, and I thought I could pick every master lock. This is pure evil, and um, and it makes me wish that master lock could make uh, locks like this. But then the other thing is that uh, you know you've got that good marketing thing. You know, if if you see if this is all you see, and these are marketed to you as you know security level nine out of ten, um, then why would you consider spending? orders of magnitude more money on a lock like this with an Asa Twin in the bottom. Um, and I love this thing. Um, yeah, you know, you, you wouldn't even consider buying, you wouldn't even know that existed or why you'd want to spend two, three hundred pounds on a lock. You know, it wouldn't just, yeah. you know, come to, your, come to your mind. And these were designed in a different time too, before the tools like this were available. Uh, yeah. You know, this battery angle doesn't right there, matter yeah. if you got a $10 lock or a, you know, $300 lock. You know these newer tools they really haven't been around that long this is what criminals are using and they don't care if you got an acid twin they don't care if you got a abloy or they don't care if you have a, a ten dollar master lock to them all of those locks give you exactly the same amount of security almost none have we tried uh, some of the hot like the abloy 330 or 342 against yeah, that I did a series. Test? yeah i did a series i had a whole bunch of locks and i took them out and i i used a die grinder to cut through them and they all you know, depending on the thickness of the shackle, I mean, there's almost no difference in how long it takes to get through these shackles. I mean, obviously, the thicker shackle you have. Now, there are other things, you know, we can go into other security measures, but the, you know, the shielded shackle is always a good idea. Uh, what little part of your shackle is exposed, fill it up with heavy chain to make it hard to get at. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. That one, like Ash's lock there. And that way it takes them a lot longer to get through it. I mean, Chain a chain a giant dog to it. I mean, stand by it with a twelve gauge shotgun. There's any number of things you can do to reduce the possibility. But to, for a standalone lock, locking up a bike or locking up a motorcycle, for example, there's not too many locks or chains that these newish. I mean, twenty years, less than twenty years for these battery powered ones. There's not too many that these guys won't defeat. That's sad. It really is. Have sad, you seen them get gummed up if they, if polymer gets into the mix, just the, and uh, trying to cut through that? Which not too many chains and locks make use of polymer. It'll be hard to make a big polymer insert, I suppose. Um, I have seen one manufacturer, and it didn't slow me down that much. I, I didn't see a lot of buildup of polymer on the cutting disc. Uh, I understand that's the the new wave, you know, the the new idea that's supposed to defeat these things. I, I haven't seen them be very successful yet. Mm -hmm. Ash, uh, what is that? I want to add something. Oh well, uh, th this this is one of the uh, a, a random eBay find. Like a from bylock? Who didn't, who didn't? Yeah, it's a bylock. Um, but if you open it, it's got a completely hidden um, shacklets for a chain. I've never seen a lock like this since, and this was just a, an eBay find off somebody who I don't think knew what it was, and I didn't know what it was at the time. But um, and it's and it's and it spins as well. I've never seen anything oh, like man. it. Oh man, that's a thing, isn't Ash. it? Yeah, send that to me, Ash. Yeah, I'll send it to you. Grinder. <laughs> no, I'm Here's a grinder. recent purchase of mine from eBay with a completely hidden shackle. Look how this is what you see when you lock this thing up. And oh, there's wow. the shackle down there. That thing is, uh, that, this comes from your neck of the woods, Ash. This is a, you know, a Yale that was only sold in the British market, I believe. But getting back to the question of, of master lock from the not so civil engineer, and I'm gonna put this out there because this is one of the not so civil engineers uh, inventions, a little, a little circle for putting key and knob cylinders in for practicing. But That's very cool. um, master lock, there's some stuff that yes, they will keep honest people honest. But if I go to my gym where, where I work out, this is probably the most common lock that I see on oh, yeah. lockers. Oh yeah. And I think honestly, this lock is inexcusable. You know, just oh, getting yeah. a normal comb pick, mm -hmm. you know, I can open these things up as fast as using a key. It's absolutely ridiculous, you know, exactly how bad this is. 
And a company like Masterlock should know better. I mean, comb picks have been around since the 1930s. Um, it's something that uh, it looks like I'm just using a regular key. And, you know, that a company like Masterlock that has essentially a leading position on the market could put something like this out that is essentially lock design malpractice. Um, it, it, it's inexcusable. And I have to think there's something wrong with the corporate culture that something like this could make it to market. I agree. That's why we keep going after them. I mean, I make fun of them all the time, despite them threatening to sue me a couple of times. I just, I can't, for, I can't forgive them. I can't just forgive them. For the some problem. of us have done some machining thinking of, cause you know, retooling, especially where the economy of scale with which they bring products to market, I understand they don't want to change their whole operation. Thinking of preventing over travel, do you think even the drop, if they dropped in tiny rods on top of the driver pins inside of the, the, the chamber springs, right? That would limit over travel. I'm trying to think if that would be feasible. They wouldn't even have to retool their pins, let alone their yes. chambers. It's feasible and it's been done. Um, the Chicago lock company did them on their ACE2 locks. Yeah, they integrated they them into the pins on those. That there was a. Uh, a a vulnerability there. Uh, what I see on a lot of, lo of master locks is that they they like having reversible pins. So it doesn't matter what direction they're dropped into the lock. I suppose yeah. it makes manufacturing a little bit more simple. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something like that clearly could not be used if they had machinery that was indifferent to the direction in which the uh, the pin was dropped into the lock. Yeah. And just to the point, I know that, that Bill used the line that we've heard, and I've been very, I've always disliked the line because I think people misunderstand it. When people say locks only keep honest people honest, we've all heard that to death and it's, it, it's over reductive and it's, it's over simplistic and it doesn't really convey what I think most of us believe. But I've started to use the word, especially for that little 142 series that you held up, symbolic locks. There are, there are some locks that just represent someone else's conveying to the world, oh, this is my space, please stay out. But we don't really have yeah, a I'd good toolkit of language. <laughs> you know, we don't, because they all appear next to each other on the shelf at Home Depot. They're going to be right next to an American lock and a, something else. But th there's no sign that says like, well, these locks are just kind of like, not really locks. So yeah. Do you think we'll see, I know there was another question from uh, Yukov. Do you think the legal landscape will change either in terms of uh, lock picking, getting more scrutiny from law enforcement, or I'll even flip it and say, do you think there will ever be a time that, I mean, Ash could speak to this in the, in the other side of the ocean, the scrutiny from law enforcement and especially insurance is much more on the manufacturers over there. And there are insurance ratings, the star system. Do you think American markets will ever see that kind of granular rating to our locks? We're not close to it. I'll tell you that much. Um, oh, I got this package right you know, here. Seven out of ten. Come on, it's good, right? Yeah, you know, there's there's a long tradition going back hundreds of years, particularly in the UK, of um, but but all over Europe, to to be honest, of insurance companies specifying the types of locks that need to protect insured assets. And that's everything from your homeowner's insurance, what sort of locks that you need on your door to what sort of locks that you need to put on your bike if you're going to insure it. Um, and the insurance institutes have been an awesome gatekeeper in, um, in the quality and security of locks because you know it's their money at stake. Mm -hmm. We don't have anything similar in the US. So I don't see that happening anytime in the near future. I see Ash holding up a, I think that's an ERA insurance lock. Um, yeah. But yeah. When, when something says insurance lock in the UK, that actually means something. You know, yeah. An institute has probably looked at it and determined that that's, uh, that's approved to secure a certain value level of asset. Uh, we don't have anything here, and I don't see anything on the horizon in the U.S. for that. Uh, so. I, I don't. I don't think we ever will. I'm mean, having lived most of my life in Europe. Um, it seems like here in the states, the culture has a different attitude towards. I mean, everything is motivated to cost. 
mm-hmm. no matter what you're shopping for. It seems like pre- people want the first thing they want to know is, you know, not not what's the guarantee or what the insurance rating or, uh, you know, how long will it last? They want to know how much does it cost. And I think when we get companies like this to do the mass production at a low cost, they haven't made overseas. I think there's so many of these that. I don't believe we are, we will ever be lucky enough to have a, a formal rating system like they do uh, in Europe. We're always going to be motivated by price. And this is um, another example. Um, we got the British standard um, accreditation and some insurers actually asked for lots, which um, are, you know, British standard. Uh, so, so it's a, yeah, it's, it's a strange one. All right. Oh, so we, we were talking about, uh, you know, we're engaging with the community a great deal here and people sending you locks and people commenting and we're loving all the comments. I'm trying to get to uh, both the Twitch stream comments as well as the pre, you know, written questions we have. But we fortunately on the Twitch haven't seen too many of folks like people who act in bad faith and trolls. And uh, how do you like to engage with the viewer community, whether they're positive people? I know, I mean, you know, we spoke about how it's impossible to keep up with YouTube comments nowadays, but from some really good interactions via email and versus trolls or crazy interactions via email. Any good stories there? I guess I'll start off. Um, I have a policy on my channel um, of, you know, the most free expression humanly possible. Doesn't matter if people are calling me names, insulting me, insulting what I do. Uh, I draw essentially two lines and that's at um, sexually and racially abusive language. That is the only reason I will delete a comment Mm -hmm. on my channel. Other than that, I'm all for, for letting the the free discussion flow. Um, Yeah. As far as trolls go, um, I follow the, the axiom don't feed the trolls. I generally don't (laughs) reply to people like that, at least not anymore. Um, I certainly did not do that when I first started out and certainly for the not first couple of years, um, I've learned quickly and, uh, and that's my approach now. I'm with Harry. I mean, when we first started on YouTube, there was no way to handle trolls. They, they could post pretty much whatever they wanted. There wasn't a lot we could do about it, but YouTube has now given us some pretty powerful tools and I've automated pretty much what Harry just mentioned. I, uh, I, I do monitor all my comments. I do read them. I may not reply to all of them or even a small portion, but the first thing I do when I see a really nasty comment is I'll send the person a warning. I, I will send them a warning and eliminate the comment. Mm-hmm. And then I write the name down. And then if it happens again, uh, I ban the person. And it's so easy for me to do. I push a single button and that yeah. person is gone from the channel forever. Their, their comments, good or bad from that point forward, will never again appear. And I, you know, that, that, that's the way to handle it. The other powerful tool that uh, YouTube has given us is what they call a filter. When people start using words and the, the, you know, the, the derogatory terms seem to change almost every week, there's a new one. And as soon as I'm aware of what it is, if it's abusive in any way, I put it in my filter. And if somebody uses that word, it automatically shuttles their comment over to a holding area, which Mm -hmm. there are so many in the holding area. I'll be honest, that's almost like banning. I never get a chance to go through them all and I don't bother. If people are going to use language like that, that fall into my filtered words category. And I I don't think anybody should have to read stuff like that. Yeah, I I probably don't get anyway near the traffic that you guys do. But uh, I have to say that it's very rare I get any anything really bad. And um, I think Harry once warned me not to feed the trolls, but uh, I, there's just a little part of me. It's like, maybe, maybe, maybe I can, you know, bring them around. But there's, just, uh, there's, there's like a couple of people who, I mean, they're not leading their best lives. Oh, isn't that sweet? It. He still has hope. <laughs> yeah, I love that. It, it, I after still the first two hope. years, I got rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, for yeah. those Sting people watching who aren't um, like full creators, uh, that that's uh, it is impressive. Over the years, YouTube still hasn't made it super easy to use the comment section uh, and to search it and to interact, but they have made it easier to police it up. And that uh, as as people are people like 
you know, on social media, you block someone. I love the YouTube. Uh, it's just hide user from channel. So they don't really even get a notification. They're just, you just make them not exist. Yep. And they're in their house, you know, like crying into their mayonnaise about how the, the LGBTQ people are ruining lock picking, who knows what, and just ranting into the void and their words just go nowhere. No, it's great. And see, the, the beauty of it is they don't get notified that the YouTube has yeah. banned them. So they can keep posting comments. They just don't show up anywhere. So I have no idea. It's a beautiful system. <laughs> 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 can, I, can I can I just uh, uh, say though that the lock picking community in general um, are fantastic. Uh, you know whether you meet them uh, in person at cons or uh, meetups or or online, the vast vast majority of of people are uh, just generous with their their knowledge. Sometimes their locks um, and their experience, and and just honestly a very welcoming community. I agree. I've um, I agree. I've never had a bad. I've gone to. Go on. I was going to say, I've been to a fair number of lock sport events. Um, yeah, I don't advertise who I am, but um, talk about a bunch of great people. It's very, very rare to see anyone where you at least would suspect they have ill intent. Mm -hmm. Just good people, a lot of fun. Um, it's a really nice, supportive community. Uh, it's it's, nice it's really you. the lock Dance sport community. Everyone in Seattle that year. Yeah. I'm sorry. Then you beat the pants off everyone when you came up to here in Seattle for the championships. Well, that was a lot of fun too. That's oh, <laughs> he, he's for those of you who don't know, he's referring to the the only lock picking competition I've ever been in, um, and uh, I had more than a little bit of this while we were doing it, and uh, <laughs> it was a ton of fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I want to check in with everyone time-wise. We've been going pretty good here. We, we've got a, you know, I don't know if we're just stopping at the top of the hour in maybe 20 minutes. There have been just a, an amazing series of questions and all like super big credit to Lady Merlin and Max in the background on Tools uh, Slack who've been feeding me the Twitch questions. How's everyone feeling? Are we, are we still doing good here? Because a lot of people have things they want to say. I'm doing great. Let's, uh, yeah. let's try to Let's try to cut it off around three o'clock Eastern time. Um, okay. I've got, I've got some meat sitting on the smoker that's waiting for my attention. So, <laughs> well then, all right then. Just we'll put we'll put you all on the spot then. Um, the real B and E to, from A to Z. I don't know if that's actually CEP or not, but they're asking, do you have a good story of a time? By the way, well, I'm going to stop you right now. Yeah. That is, I've seen uh, him post on my channel a lot. Love the name. B &E I'm wondering though if he's Love. really from from back. If those who don't know, B and E from A to Z was quite the video that was like this internet war. I don't know yep. if uh, have you yeah. cut your hair since that video, good sir? Because uh, he's asking, <laughs> when's the last time you were embarrassed by a lock? Potentially a lock that was really simple that you're like, how am I not opening this? <laughs> <laughs> every day, every day. Locks never seem to cooperate. Uh, one day I can open it. You know, this is a good example. I mean, I might open that in, you know, 10 seconds. And then the next day, for whatever reason, it just refuses to open. I can't mm -hmm. tell you how. And the more frustrated I get, the the less it will cooperate. And I think that's true for most locks. You just, I don't know if it's the stress or, or what, but I, I am routinely embarrassed by different locks. I alluded to this earlier when I said I'll never say that, yes, I can open a lock. I'll say I can probably open it or, you know, or I've opened locks like that before because, as Bill said, every single lock is different. And you know, there might be a particular brand and model where I have opened one in 30 seconds and I'll sit down with another one and it'll take me five minutes or like that Zeta lock we were talking before, I'll sit down with it for three hours before I finally give up and say, you know, I don't know what's going on. And, and the um, next day, next day you rake it open. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, if people ask me, are there locks you can't pick? Um, I say, no, there's a lot of locks I can't pick yet, but there's certainly a fair number of them that I have not figured out yet. Mm -hmm. And the more pressure that's on you, for example, if you say, you know, people are hand you a lock, say, oh, I heard you're a lock picker. Can you open this? And if you say, well, yeah, of course I can open that. That guarantees failure every yeah. single time. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, the first, that's the jinx. The, 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 the first yeah. day, 
the first day of any uh, lock meetup, it was like over a couple of days. Um, I can't pick. I can't pick on the first day. It just doesn't happen. It's uh, it's 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 nerves. I, um, I, I, I just stress. It, it doesn't happen. And I'm embarrassed by locks every single day. Um, and sometimes, and also, you know, the only lock you can't pick is one you haven't tried. Right. That's the only guaranteed lock you cannot <laughs> pick. So you got to keep trying and, and never be put off, especially to any uh, new pickers. You'll be really surprised how some of the most intimidating locks can be, you know, uh, just simplicity itself to pick. And some of the ones which um, you We're might think are, like... yeah, you just, just, you might think of like, you might think a little, you go, oh, how cute. Uh, that's going to be real easy to pick. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it is not easy. I, I've not picked this yet. And in fact, is that a Wilson Bahanan? What is that? Um, this Looks is like a little American. American. Eagle. This ah. is, yeah, this is an old yeah. eagle. By, this yeah. is sent to me by rubber it's band. An and, uh, and they've got a yeah. great keyway. Yeah. Yeah, and great, great keyway. And also just like uh, the, the worst um, bitting. But, well, the best. Like, <laughs> but yeah, great best, What a great best lock. Worst bitting it could have. And uh, yeah, uh, but you know, you look at a lock like that and you think, uh, you know, this will be easy. And then you look like a, something like this beautiful Vero monolith seven pins and think, well, I'll never be able to pick a lot like that. And actually, um, it honestly, I'd have been able to pick this um when I first started picking, it's, it's really easy compared to to, to, to this. And yeah, I, I'd just say to people, I think all of us are probably embarrassed by um, a lock uh, now and again, uh, but but don't be put off. You know, it's just go on to the next one, come back to it in a couple of months time and uh, you'll, you'll probably yeah. get it. Sleeper locks. <laughs> yep. yep. Or Bill, you and I have done work, you know, in live scenarios on doors. You get the situation where a lock will turn the wrong way all day long. But yep. you're like trying to turn it the correct way. You're like, son of a bitch. Yep. And you don't have a plug spinner ever when that happens. Well, I, like you, I don't like people to watch me when I'm doing it. I can work really well when nobody's watching. But if I've got three guys standing around and they're all nervous on the trigger and they're like, come on, man, come on, get it open. Yeah, yeah that's when it will not happen. That's when we need to get exactly. the <laughs> Now, this, this leads to especially um, people who are just starting out and they are kind of nervous or... It's a fun tie-in to some of the technique you folk have discussed. Uh, Drayden, Drayden T asks about turning pressure, turning tool, tension tool pressure. Um, there's been for the longest time this sort of the, the canon was well, you'd be super light touch. Uh, but yeah. many of you, especially Bill and lockpicking lawyer, and I believe sometimes even lock will say no, like you, some of this lock requires heavy tension. And it's like, which one of you coined the phrase the tension is as much as the lock will suffer without causing a failure mode? Uh, I think Harry um, probably coined that, but um, I'm probably the that, one that, that pushed sums it. up my approach. <laughs> well, you know, this is one of the, you know, we talk about learning from each other. And I went for years and years and years convinced that light tension was the answer. And that's all I would use because I was so positive that I was right and everybody else was wrong. And then Harry came into the lock lab when he and I, you know, first met. And I ended up giving him a bunch of the locks that I considered to be impossible. And very quickly, see, he's known for that super heavy tension, or at least was. And he took my locks home and within a week or two had opened them all by using super heavy tension. And then he gave them back to me. And I thought, how in the world did he do that? And I, I learned from him. I tried the heavy tension and suddenly they were all popping for me. So there's no right answer. I, I'm convinced you just got to, it's like trial and error. Some... Some take that light tension and some you've got to, you know, like use that pry bar to force. Now, is that the same thing as bully picking when you talk no, about that's, that? That's what I call it. I call it bullying. And I've learned for, again from, from Harry that I, I, my first approach now is to bully it. I found that to be very, very successful. I'll put super heavy tension almost to the point to where I'm, I mean, I've got that tension on there and you can see on my thumb, I'm really leaving a dent and just really torquing it. And I'll force those pins in place. And you'd be surprised how often that works. Do you ever have I to re-bend your picks back in the middle of the process while you're well, keeping Well, see, that's, that's why I'm, you know, I'm bending these back a lot more than I used to. Yeah, I, I'll admit it. <laughs> it's, totally, it's totally worth it because the technique works. And it's all about getting the open. And if it costs me a pick or two, so what? I have an expression I say fairly often, and that is there is no wrong way as long as the lock opens. Um, so you know, some techniques might work best for others. Some techniques 
you know, are, are absolutely worthless for one person and are golden for another person. I, a long time ago, I put forth uh, one, a video called, I believe, My Approach to Lockpicking Tension. Um, and it was my realization, kind of one of these, the emperor has no clothes moments where I was a fairly new picker and I saw everyone was saying, you super light tension. Um, and that just wasn't working for me. Um, so I, I put this video out there talking about my approach, how I liked heavier tension. Uh, it seems to have caught on a little bit, but the bottom line is that might not work for some people. Some people might like lighter tension better. You know, whatever opens the lock for you, you're doing it right. The only way you're doing it wrong is if the lock doesn't pop. Yeah, if, it, if what you're doing doesn't work, try something different. Mm -hmm. I, but I think mm -hmm. I think that our listeners are probably looking for a rule of thumb. And if I had to give a rule of thumb on tensioning, it would be that if the lock contains standard pins, then heavy, moderate or heavy tension is probably the way to, a good place to start. If your lock contains mm -hmm. serrated pins, then you better be using light tension because if you use that moderate or heavy, you're going to seize up the lock. And if you've got spool pins, it's going to be somewhere in between, and you're going to have to fluctuate your tension to allow the spool to get through the shear line. I mean, if I had to encapsulate tensioning in a few sentences, I think that would be a good starting point. Yeah. I think there's I think some kinds of pins, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ash. Oh, thank you. Um, I was going to say, I think for me, I, you know, I've not been picking as long as you guys, so I still remember... Um, you know, that frustration of going, why won't this lock work? You know, uh, why won't it open? Why, why is everyone on YouTube able to pick this? And I think there's that there's a fine balance between me understanding how to pick a lock and guessing some locks open and uh, raking locks. Um, and then that slow switch to that, oh, I actually know what pin I'm on. I can really feel the pin state. I can feel it bind and feel it overset and feel it underset. And, and I think some some of that just it just takes time. There isn't anything you can do in terms of um, heavy tension or light tension um, uh, to to get a lock open. Sometimes where practice just needs to happen. I think there's a, a big um, a wedge of time in, in lock picking when you begin, where you'll get a lock open um, partially out of skill, partially out of luck, and you don't know what you did or or why it won't open the second time. And I think that over time you just get more of a feel for what's happening inside a lock. Not every lock, some are just seriously difficult to pick, but um, but I think that there is that, that thing where you just have to practice, it's just practice sometimes. That I think that's, you know, you, you said the, the magic word there. We got so many people that want the fast answer. I mean, we all do the same thing. We buy the magic pick, we buy the magic tensioner, we buy the this book or that book, convinced that that's gonna be the ultimate answer in, in teaching me how to open all these locks. But We've all got hobbies. Um, a couple of my, I, I fly drones, and I, I can't tell you how many drones I crashed before I finally managed to fly it proficiently. Uh, I play the guitar. You guys noticed I have, you know, calluses everywhere. Again, it's practice, and lock picking is the same. The more you practice at any, you know, at anything like guitar playing, drone flying, or lock picking, the more you practice, the better you're going to get. I wish I could you know, concentrate that down into a few pages in a book because I would get rich or create a magic pick, but it's, it's going to take time. If you want to get good at anything, we all know you got to practice. Take it from me. You don't get rich making a book. Everyone else on the stream, people have asked us, what do you do when you're not behind the camera with locks? What other hobbies do some people have? Well, uh, I guess Bill just answered that, but let me uh, let me jump in here. Lock picking was actually a, uh, a replacement for a lot of hobbies I had. I had just moved to DC. Um, I had just had uh, my wife had just given birth to my son. Mm -hmm. I found myself without a lot of time um, in my life. I was very much into two things before I moved to the DC area that was you know, longer range target shooting and modifying and racing cars. Um, in the DC area, I lost all of my, um, my friends. Oh God. 
I lost all of my lock picking friends, or I'm sorry, my car modifying friends, and there was no place to go shooting. Mm -hmm. So uh, lock picking sort of replaced my other hobbies, and it's turned into a uh, a real passion of mine um, to the point where I don't have a lot of other hobbies right now. This is what I do when I want to have fun. Right on, Ash. How about you? I, well, I had no idea that um, that uh, that in in a way Harry's uh, start reflected mine. It's just you know it's true you, you, when you have a, a kid. Sometimes all your hobbies they go away, and then you you know lock picking is a, a great filler. I mean, I, I, I used to I used to do loads of things. Um, I used to read I used to read books, um, but yeah, I used to play guitar. Um, <laughs> I used to do um, or I, I used to do origami. Um, this, by the way, is made of one piece of paper. I made oh that. Oh my recently. god! Yeah, this wow. one piece that, uh, that is really cool. One piece, piece of paper, fifty centimeters long. I actually have a video I'm going to upload in a few weeks um, of me folding one of these on camera. Um, but oh I found it in god. a secondhand. Freaking awesome! Yeah, um, and uh, so so yeah. I mean, um, I used to do so much, um, and and now I sort of did so little. And then I started to do lock picking, and it's brilliant. But then, <laughs> but then it isn't just lock picking. It isn't just lock picking. That's that's the amazing thing. It's like um, you know, you do like uh, I, I can still do like logo design. So I can still do my art. So I can still do um, you know, I, I can still make things. You know, I've got uh, three sets of challenge pins that um, Sparrows bless them um, took up. You know, I, I can I can you know just make random tools and uh, a lock picking as a hobby for me. It isn't just picking locks. It's um, it's creating. And new designs it's it's making new tools it's learning uh, new equipment it's getting used to like 3d printing it's uh it's uh, learning to video edit it's uh you know mm -hmm. it, it, it's so much more that it isn't just like oh i pick locks it's like um lock picking is like 10 different hobbies for me now so it's you know yeah. it's uh, yeah. it's 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 that's all a really good point in yeah, each one of them that's, I mean, lock the picking taught me how to machine <laughs> Yeah, when how I, many of I us have learned, um, like, generations younger than a lot of us are doing the 3D print thing, the laser cutting, or even the multimedia, like, how many of us, this has been, for me, it's a forcing function that makes sure I have to learn new skills just to learn them. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. It's, uh, it's taken me down a path of things I never would have expected. Um, you know, metal machining being one of them, you know, creating tools, 3D modeling, uh, video editing, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah, there, I suppose yeah. there is a whole bunch uh, yeah, you, encompassed in it that I wouldn't have thought of until Ash just said that. Yeah, I didn't realize how much there was until Ash just brought it all up. <laughs> and Ash is British, so we know he also still spends time in the garden, I'm sure, this time of year. <laughs> um, have you been to Britain this <laughs> year? <laughs> I only have so many umbrellas. <laughs> Isn't so, it still winter time there? This oh, is interesting. Speaking of raining. People, people trying to get all the right information, uh, Yukov asks, the community seems really fragmented. Not, not everyone sort of knows each other, but some information is like on Reddit and some of it's on a Discord server over here. And a lot of us used to have accounts on like Lockpicking 101 and there's YouTube. And do you think it's good to have this diversity of, of resources? Or do you wish that it was a little more centralized so that there was more of a unified message and resource? I don't think a unified message is ever a good idea. I love a diversity of ideas. Um, I know for a fact that I would not be um, able to open most of the locks I could open now were it not for the fact that I was able to develop my skills on my own. Um, and develop techniques on my own. So, you know, fracturing in the community doesn't bother me even a little bit. Um, a consensus generally, um, I suppose in some, some subject areas, it can be a good thing, uh, but it also can sometimes be a lack of intellectual curiosity and exploration. So, um, you know, when I started learning to pick, I was watching a lot of Bosnian and Bill videos. I took a ton of, you know, what he was showing and teaching and adopted as my own. I also developed a lot that uh, became my own that was, well, new to me. I, I, 
I won't be arrogant enough to say that I'm the first person to ever do anything I've really done. Um, but you know, fracturing in the community doesn't bother me even a little bit because it allows different trains of thought to, to develop. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't view it quite as, um, I, I like the diversity. I like all of the different areas because it seems like there's uh, on the different boards, people come up with different ideas and different approaches. And if everything were on one information system, I don't think we would get the benefit of these different approaches. Uh, right now, if you want to know something about abloy locks, you go to one board. If you want to know something about multi-locks, you go to another. And there are experts there and groups of people who have just hyper-focused on those things. And that's the benefit of having this, this diversity in, uh, of information sources. I, I agree. Um, I think we're very, very lucky being uh, on YouTube is that people will sort of uh, congregate around us as well in terms of, uh, you know, a small community. Um, but I think the more communities out there in a way that the better, um, the only downside of that is if you're trying to find a community to slot into and you think, oh, I really want to get into lock picking, what forum should I go to? And then you find out there's like, you know, 12 Facebook groups, a couple of discords, a Reddit, uh, about 10, you know, it's, it's really... You know, Oh. <laughs> that, that, no, I'm waiting for you, Ash. I'm getting ready. All <laughs> oh, right, no. <laughs> you fired me no. up. <laughs> no, I was, was going to say, you know, it's it's, um, it's it's just one of those things where, um, yeah, I think when you when you just want to get into the community, a fractured community can be a lot harder. But from the outside, um, of course, the variety is the spice of life. So it's it's both a good thing and I think um, a, a bad thing depending on where you are in your journey. I know we're getting tight on time, but there are one or two questions that are important ones before we go. One is, um, it seems like outsiders to the community love to make the stupid joke, you know, like, oh, is it, you're just a bunch of criminals, right? Like, how do you, you know, I'm going to go to like go, go to criminal school. Did you learn that in jail or some bullshit? Um, how do you respond to people that love to make the That's easy sweat, stupid joke about, you know, oh, lock pickers are all criminals? I, I know it's so tiring because we've all said this a million times, but we have a good audience right now. One or two words on why this is not a criminal skill at all in, in most ways from anybody. Uh, I actually laugh when I hear that. And I just say, show me one instance where someone picked a lock rather than smash it with a hammer or a crowbar or a die grinder. I mean, those are much, much more common attacks. Uh, smashing a window, kicking in doors. I mean, this is like... This is like Sudoku. This is a puzzle. It's a combination of uh, a mental thing as well as manual coordination, trying to uh, tie those two things together to attack a puzzle. To me, mm -hmm. that's how I view this. And I think most of us view it that way. It's a challenge and, and it takes a lot of skill and it takes time. It's just a hobby. I can't imagine. I mean, I work with law enforcement a lot. I know I've got a lot of friends still in law enforcement. None of them can give me a single instance of where a thief took the time to pick a lock. Uh, one more personal example. I had my own shed, my work shed broken into about three weeks ago. A guy mm -hmm. came through. He didn't break in anybody's houses or workshops. He just went to the sheds and he just pried them open with a pry bar. And he took people's you know, gardening implements, you know, my backpack blower, for example. Yeah. Uh, there was an excellent lock, a really super lock on that, on that door. And he bypassed it with a crowbar by prying the door off. So <laughs> criminals don't pick locks, guys. Criminals. Have you ever seen accounts from your Leo friends of criminals trying to bump locks? I've, I know a few people who've been caught with what look like bump keys or shitty jiggle keys. That's about the most I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's always going to be, um, attacks whether it's uh bumping locks or bypassing them uh breaking them die grinders and uh, i think it's always that balance between what we show but we all have our, our our scale about what we're willing to show and what we're happy to show the thing is there's always that thing with if you don't show say for example somebody brought out um you know uh the, the most amazing bike lock in the world um but you know there was such an easy technique where you could open it in three seconds it's probably better to get that information out there because the lock manufacturers it's not in their best interest to do that. Um, but it's, it's always this, this balance between what you're willing to show and, and why, because it isn't just about lock picking, it's about other entry techniques. And I guess that uh, we all have our, our, our spectrum of what we feel morally is right to show. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a case of 
you know, if I was trying to buy a lock or I was interested in a lock um, and I was doing my research, I guess I'd want to know if there was a, a known um, uh, problem or bypass or, or, or risk with having that lock because then I'll be able to make a more informed decision. Um, I don't I don't really think that ignorance is the best place to start. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky one. Lock picking lawyer, any thoughts I'll on wait, whether this I'll has anything on to this. do with criminality? Um, and do you do any criminal for, representation if someone needs a lawyer to get no, out of jail? No, none at all. Absolutely none. Um, lock picking and, and really locksmithing in general has been governed by a code of secrecy, essentially, for literally hundreds of years. And it's only been broken very, very recently, probably in the last 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I've spoken to a lot of locksmiths, a lot of you know, government covert entry types um, who have said that's probably a good thing. I disagree because it has led to some of the worst locks and security we can possibly imagine. It's led to things like this because there is ignorance among the consumers as to the level of security locks actually provide, um, locks like this are allowed to, to be proliferated. Um, and they say sunlight's the best disinfectant. People need to know what they're buying. They need to know if it's an absolute piece of garbage. And unfortunately, the secrecy that has pervaded this community for literally hundreds of years has led to a an absolute cornucopia of worthless locks on the market. And unfortunately, people just don't know. So I see this as almost, you know, like the crusade of Ralph Nader. Um, yeah. People need to know the level of security they're actually provided by what they're purchasing. And unfortunately, there is a large disconnect right now between what people think they're buying and what they're actually buying. And a um, lot of the sort more, of Amazon market with the problem of fake reviews and promo uh, products that you have cut through a lot of that BS, I think that's a valuable service to the consumer. Yeah. The, the more information on the market, the better, and it can only lead to manufacturers upping their game. So, yeah. you know, I certainly appreciate people saying that you know, oh, you're, you're giving information to potential criminals, you're showing people how to bypass locks. But I also see that as a very short term point of view. The more education there is in the public, uh, the more people will make educated decisions in their security uh, choices and uh, purchases, and the better locks will become in the long run. Well, speaking of the long run, I know that we're getting close to the top of the, the hour. We thought some people had to peel out. Uh, I don't know if anyone can stick around. We, we still have a long list of questions. I would love to see these voices come together again, uh, not just in the context of Circle CityCon, but in other videos or another panel. Uh, one of us, it, any, who, we'll, we'll draw straws. And one of us who has a, you know, a YouTube week that we don't have good content, they get to post a future panel video if we answer the rest of the questions, which I... I promise we will save from the community here who is weighing in. Um, but just looking into the future, do any of you want to speak about the future of your channels, where you think YouTube will go for you? Uh, you can speak about either monetization, demonetization. I know that once something becomes kind of a job, is it less a hobby? Is it less fun? Do you still have the same passion? Do you think you'll You'll be doing it in five years. Do you think you two will be around in five years? Do you think America will be around in five years? Who knows? <laughs> What's the future hold for each of you? Oh, boy. The deep questions. Um, well, certainly YouTube will be around. Um, I don't think I'll ever look at this as a job. Um, certainly it is not a job financially. Uh, if for no other reason than I spend... I'm not going to say how much, but it is an embarrassing amount of money <laughs> per year on locks. Um, and YouTube is awesome because it's allowing me to finance my hobby uh, through through ad money. As far as plans for the future, um, well, coming up with new fresh ways of getting people to look at locks is is not an easy thing to do. 
Um, a lot of times I try to find the most interesting locks and show them in the most interesting ways. Sometimes that's through, um, through throwing, through showing uh, very easy defeats of common locks. Sometimes it's through showing uh, historic locks and giving a little bit of historic context. That's one of the things I really love about locks is the way you can look at a culture through the locks that they've used. Um, as far as what I see in the future, I see a lot of the same, but the same for me is is pretty diverse. I try to keep things a little bit different. I try to show things in a historic perspective. I try to show fresh attacks. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll get to the point where, you know, I have a fair bit of engagement with lock manufacturers. I'd like to see more of that in the future. Um, and I think the more popular my channel and in general lock picking on YouTube becomes, we'll see more of that because lock manufacturers will <laughs> start to understand that consumers are educated now and they're looking for a quality products, not just the cheapest product they can put together um, that looks secure. So that was a little bit rambling, but, but that's what I see in the future. Great. Well, on my channel, I think you've probably noticed I've changed a lot over the years. As time has gone on, I've tried to modify things, but uh, I've got to say that with YouTube, um, Every, most of the modern, very, very successful channels seem to be governed more by uh, metrics. And the current metric is nobody wants to watch a long video. They always want to watch something. I think the current number is two minutes and 48 seconds or less, if you, believe, if you believe the metrics. Really hard to do uh, in lock picking, particularly if you want to do the gutting and show people. <laughs> I've, I've done short videos and you always catch a lot of heat for it. Because people say, why did you exclude this? Why didn't you show that? And I've just decided that I'm going to show everything that needs to be shown. I can't be governed by whatever the popular metric is of the day. Now, that isn't to say I won't. I mean, if I suddenly start losing uh, subscribers or become, you know, by fading into the, into the history book, it might be time to adapt to whatever the new standard is. But, yeah, two minutes and 48 seconds is just not doable. No. I don't. I don't want it to become a job, though. Um, I think I enjoy this. This is a really, to me, a very challenging and interesting hobby. I have offers, uh, or not all the time, but I used to have them all the time. Offers of from different companies to partner with this or consult on that, and I always turn them down because I always felt that if I um, if I go to work for that company or if I consult for that company and I act as their, you know, their engineer or whatever, I am a mechanical engineer. Uh, then I would feel um, beholden to them. Mm -hmm. I would feel like I've suddenly lost my independence. And then when you do that, people no longer believe what you have to say about things. And I really don't want to go down that path. So the day that it stops becoming fun is the day that I do my last video. And right on. it's fun. So I'm going to keep doing it at least, at least for now. Ash, how about you? What's the future hold? Um, well, I have to agree. You know, this is this is a hobby for me. It's uh, it's what I enjoy doing. It's my passion, and I don't feel I've even scraped the surface. I mean, um, I think I said earlier that it isn't just one hobby. There's so many hobbies, so many things that are linked to it, and my mind is always just thinking, "But what if? And what about that? And wouldn't that be good? And oh, this new pen looks really cool. But what if I made that into a lock pick? And what about this? And you know, I just don't feel that I've even got anyway near the end of this hobby and um does it feel like a job well there's always that day where you just know you've got to do a bit of filming you don't fancy it but then sometimes that works in the benefit that sometimes it just gets you off the sofa stops you watching television and then you get upstairs and you go wow you know um i'm really enjoying this and what about that and then you go end up going to bed at four in the morning on a work night and you think yeah okay maybe that wasn't so good um but in terms <laughs> of in terms of the um future of the channel um I'd like to work a way to do more collaborations with uh, with other channels. I've thought of some good ideas um, about ways in which um, clearly 
we won't be able to meet up. There'll be you know, people across Europe, for example. But I'm trying to think of innovative ways so that maybe I could introduce a lark, we could pass it along to the other person virtually and they'd pick it and then pass it back to me virtually and then I'd gut it essentially either the same lock or the other half of it. You know, so it'd be a bit disembodied in, in, in a way, but it should be fun mm -hmm. and sort of um, allow um, uh, both parties get exposure with different audiences and... Uh, Oh, by the way, please subscribe. Um, you know, it, that, that was, is also um, a really good thing for me. This is never going to be um, a work. You can't live off um, the money that YouTube give you, not yeah. when you spend all the money on, on locks. Um, but seeing people subscribe and comment on your videos, um, that that just makes everything just uh, so much nicer. You know, it's, it's nothing we, you know, there's no point in me making, a, a, you know, videos which um you know are popular with people outside of lock picking because um you know personally just because this is what i like this is the reason i do this um the channel is because i just like doing lock picking all the things that come with it you know so um for me just seeing people subscribe and comment and uh and and you know just see that community change and what's going on in it for me is just uh wonderful so um i've got a, a number of things on the go in terms of what I want to make in terms of sort of tools and kits and other things like that. Um, loads of other things to show off and, and some uh, collaborations in the future. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't know where it's going to go. I never have done, but I just know that I really enjoy it and I hope other people do too. Well, I think that's a wonderful way to get close to wrapping it up. The idea that as all of you have seen this wonderful panel famous for their community they built and the connections they make on YouTube, Every one of their answers was so focused on non-screen related uh, things. And the most rewarding times in their lives sound like times they're not in front of their screen, even though YouTube and other medium like this are, are ways to connect with the community. Uh, what you're, they, they, these people that you look up to, everyone, they are most happy with you when you are writing to them, not about what like you saw on their screen, but about what you're doing in, in your life and the new thing you discovered and the new lock that you want to show up with them and with the community. So I love this. Um, I have no idea how I got lucky enough to be in the room with these powerhouses and these great voices, but I'm grateful to be here. And we're all very grateful that the three of you made the time. And everyone whose questions we didn't get to, there's already chatter in the tool slack. We want to try to do a panel like this again, uh, maybe independent from a con. <laughs> talked about other questions <laughs> this is yes the future is boundless the naughty bucket exists the bins that's my naughty bucket yeah <laughs> we are going to keep being here yeah. for all of you um final words if anyone has them but my only final words are our gratefulness that everyone uh, was here today this was wonderful please everyone uh what are your last thoughts i just wanted to say thank you for uh for bill and ash and and d for for coming on. I think this this went really well. Um, I think a lot of great information was put out there and, uh, and hopefully we can do something like this in the future. And also to the viewers, thank you very much for, for asking your questions, for, for getting engaged and, and rest assured, we'll definitely be looking at the questions that we didn't get to today and, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to put something together in the future. So cheers. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And all the viewers, I know this was much more than two minutes and 48 seconds, but we really appreciate you guys linking in and being patient with us while we figure all this out. And I can't add anything that uh, Harry and Bill haven't already said. So just uh, thank you all so much for the opportunity. It's been really, really great fun for me. Excellent. We'll see you all next time. There will be a next time. And I appreciate everyone out there. Cheers. Cheers. Salud. <laughs>